All right, so to discuss the blog post that we all came here to read. I started writing this after a coworker said something interesting to me, and I wanted to pull on the thread a little bit. I had seen a lot of different opinions on AI, a lot of very simplified and simplistic ideas. I also found it interesting because, as a lot of people already pointed out, what we're calling AI isn't necessarily AI. Frankly, I don't think that there is necessarily an all too cohesive definition of what AI is, quote unquote. Um, that would convey the same thing to everyone. So I'm calling it AI here, and I refer to it as AI as a shorthand, largely because it's that's how you talk about it. Sure, yes, we might be talking about neural networks, stable diffusion, chatbots, you know, words that in many cases refer to the same technology or refer to different technologies. I am calling it all AI for now and using the term in a context where I think it will largely be understood what I'm pointing to and gesturing towards. Um, whether these things are actually intelligent or whatever else is kind of beyond the point to me. Um, though I, I understand why people are specific about it when they, when they discuss it, but I, I am a layman, so I'm going to use layman's terms. Um, one of the things that most got me thinking was an article on Wired, which I do cite here, which is linked somewhere, which was so outrageous in its assertions that I just thought it was heretical. Um, and I, I will discuss more of the specific points, but it was so exciting to me to read something that was, you know, in a magazine that I generally quite like reading and that I admire and that I disagreed with at first so strongly, and then I came around to seeing the points of. I think in a lot of ways there's a utility to saying something extremely strange and controversial just for the sake of opening up a possible route for thought. Well, let's read this thing. In conversation with a bookshop coworker about the silliness of assuming current AI output could make into short story magazines, I realized something interesting. There was one element of my job that ChatGPT might be able to replace. This refers to the Clark's World debacle, which isn't even really a debacle, I would argue, and that hopefully doesn't diminish the how bad it was to come to work for Clark's World, probably for several days, for a month, it seems like. Um, Clark's World, which almost never closes submissions, closed their submissions because of the amount of AI-generated stories they were getting. Let me get the original post here. This is very cute also. That this is not even close to different enough for it to work, but that's very funny. Um, I think it's worth noting that the trend that Neil is talking about, Neil Clark here, appears to include just cases of out and out plagiarism. Where, you know, this is not something that AI that we're discussing right now, you know, things like ChatGPT or whatever are spitting out. This is an attempt from 2021 to, you know, pitch something that had already been published under someone else's name. Which is also really funny because if you know anything about submitting to literary magazines, something having been published is not actually a guarantee it will be published, made it clear, I think, most simply by the fact that it wasn't always published. You could send something to four literary magazines and get rejections from all four, and then send one to 12, and rejections from all 12, and so on and so forth. You could send something to 100 literary magazines and get rejected from 100, and then send it to 101st, and then get it in there. So then what? Should someone steal it from the site where it was ultimately published? and then shop it around to the magazines you were rejected from. Anyway, so this is a chart of spammy, plagiarized, etc. submissions to Clark's World. You can see it's pretty bad in February. Um, 
he notes that it was published on the 15th of February, so in half of the month, they more than doubled. Oh. That's really funny. Is January just not on here? No, it is. Okay, I was... It's not labeled. For a second, I was just thinking, did they just not even label the month in question? Um, in short, it was a lot of extra work all of a sudden, so they closed submissions. And there was this immediate wave of fear through the general writing community that, well, this is it, this is the beginning of the end, um, you know, this is how it's going to be forever, and we're, no one's ever going to get anything written to any magazine ever again. Which, you know, I, I don't think is true. I mean, you could argue this was true when, and I'm, I know this is going to sound a little silly, but I'm being serious, when computers gained popularity, right? All of a sudden, anyone who wanted to, you know, vaguely plagiarize something was so much easier to type and send somewhere. The internet? I mean, think about how much worse this problem has gotten in, in the sense of just, you know, spammy and plagiarized submissions. Since you largely stopped having to physically mail your submission to a magazine. So it's one of those cases where I think that this is a, a reasonable concern in the sense that I don't think that it's not going to matter at all. I don't think this is going to pose an issue. It's posing an issue right now. I think rather that it'll be something that we see as fairly normal and that we are more capable of dealing with. I just checked in on the chat and I see that Max said something about the Muppets. I wish I hadn't read it because it made me angry thinking about Kermit at number seven. Who was... How many Muppets are there? How could there possibly have been six Muppets above Kermit? Miss Piggy, perhaps. Well, anyway. Um, I do recommend reading all of the links that I linked because they're good links that I enjoyed reading. But in this specific case, to summarize, there's a lot of concern about whether the ways that we get around or, or just handle, you know, the deluge of spam submissions is going to affect accessibility for other people. So, for example, Here, this person points out that if you couldn't afford, oh my goodness, oh, wow. potion all over the ground, all as well. If you couldn't afford to mail your submission, or you lived out of the country, or you know, a good dozen other things. I mean, frankly, the nature of, of writing for an audience is inherently unbalanced because. And again, this is going to sound silly, but this is a legitimate thought. If you don't have a grasp of grammar, that is what literary magazines are looking for, and they all want you to type or read your own work, they all want you to be able to, you know, proof of your work such that it's nearly spotless before you submit it to them. If you don't have that, which is not a, a measure of actual, you know, I mean, what is literary talent? You could ask that, but moving on past that, it's not a measure of literary talent. It's not a measure of how hard you want to work. It's not a measure of how good your ideas are, how creative you are, even how good the piece is necessarily. Uh, but for any number of reasons, many obviously related to class, the culture, you could not have, you know, the grammatical chops, or even you know the the will to. I was going to say the will to submit, but would be confusing this context. The will to blend in, to, to play by a specific set of rules, then you would be disadvantaged for that too. So basically, any kind of gate, obviously, on some level, I mean, that's what a gate does. It makes things accessible. Obviously, though, people aren't submitting to magazines because they want to see literally everything that was submitted, so. Oh, boy. You'll have to excuse me. I've managed to get potion on my salt lamp. I'm going to pause the recording of this stream at this point so I can get the potion off of the salt lamp. Let's get back to the topic at hand now that I've cleaned everything up. Okay. Anyway, there are a lot of legitimate concerns about the Clark's World <laughs> AI issues. 
Um, I also agree about not bringing back submission fees. I hate submission fees. I hate submission fees so much. I understand why they're there, but I hate submission fees. Anyway, um, I wrote at the time that I I didn't think that this was the end of the world. Obviously, I don't think that people were saying, well, Clarkson was just going to have to close. But I was saying that, you know, everyone thinks that writing and publishing your writing is fairly easy. Just write something and make it good and then publish it. And it's not. It's so much more complicated than anything even similar to that. And people are going to figure it out with AI and this is going to go down. You know, even if AI was very, very good at writing fiction, I, I mean, first of all, there's a question of like what makes good fiction. I think people just don't understand. And I'm not saying that in some kind of like the, the sanctity of the human spirit is what makes a good story. But, you know, I think that people who don't understand how plot structure works, how character development works, how, you know, show, tell, actually manifests in a text, what good prose looks like and how that varies from writer to writer and story to story. There's so much more to have to nail down, even in our discussions on what makes good writing, before we can begin creating a neural network that could in, get anywhere near creating a coherent short story, let alone one that the average person would agree was good, which is, again, not what you need to get into a literary magazine. And it would have to be so much more specialized for, you know, literary fiction, for science fiction, fantasy, for horror. It's it just, it's so complicated where I'm um, And I, for the record, I'm very excited to see what comes out if anyone ever gets there. But two months later, they reopened to submissions because, well, it's, it's grifters. Grifters will move on when the grift doesn't work. And they did. It's just a complete waste of time for anyone to spend time with this for any reason other than, you know, having fun. Anyway. So I was talking to my, my coworker who, you know, we were going kind of back and forth about the idea that ChatGBT is producing workable fiction, which is just very funny. Um, here we go. At the shop, I occasionally write book reviews of 50 to 75 words for shop promo purposes. On my first go round of the format, my reviews felt full of stock phrases used to get across my intended meaning in a smaller space. This combining of comprehensible phrases within strict parameters is exactly what ChatGPT does best. So, could ChatGPT write my book reviews for me? Um, here I, I post some samples of my book reviews. This is so awkward. I have to read my reviews. My, my, my craft, my art, my job. So here's, here's Detransition Baby. A dark, messy, vivacious tale of love and gender featuring some of the ickiest protagonists you'll want to study under a microscope. Tori Peters crafts a deeply cynical yet always believable world in tones which oscillate from irreverent to deeply poignant, sure to thrill all of us sickos who just want to read about trans people being utterly, irredeemably nasty. There's Big Tree. I really, I tried to focus on some that I thought had, had interesting phrasing at all. So here it's study under a microscope. Um, the sickos. Frankly, I think mentioning trans people. I, I don't know if ChatGPT could do a really good job writing in my voice just because I'm not that normie. Big Tree. Selznick's latest offering has been five years in the making and the result will not disappoint. His classic meticulously detailed art style meets a fresh new narrative direction as he explores life from the perspective of two seedlings in the I'm not even going to try to pronounce it era. Marilyn and Louise's journey of survival family and love is at once well researched, vibrantly engaging, and a catalyst for laughter and tears in any reader with a beating heart or emerging roots. I think I did a good review for that one. Emerging Roots is good. I went to everybody in the store and I said, look at the, look at Emerging Roots. How's that? And they said, it is a good review. We do what we do in the dark. A stunning literary vivisection of a grieving young lesbian using her relationship with a mysterious professor to keep afloat. Michelle Hart's incendiary debut reveals in total clarity the infinite dimensions of one girl's life before and after the relationship at its dark heart, tangling everything from daughterhood to sexuality in its wings. A glittering, underrated must-read. I actually, the other day, had someone come into the store and ask for me by name. I, I don't know if they remembered my name, but so, you know, I hear a page and I go, what's this? And I walk over and they have this person who claims to have been giving a recommend, given a recommendation for me a long time ago. And I actually remember her. She asked for a recommendation for her girlfriend based who likes fiction on the literary side, preferably lesbian in some way, if possible. And I said, say no more, and led her to this book. And apparently her girlfriend really liked it, and she was back for more. 
Um, so I recommended her Disha Filia's um, book of short stories, Secret Lives of Church Ladies. There we go. That I had not, I, I think I still do not have a text review on my Goodreads for, but is also great and is also literary side of lesbian fiction. White Cat, Black Dog. This is it, my must read, total love. Everybody talk to me about this book of the season. Kelly Link takes all the fairy tales you thought you knew and uses them to elicit it's fine tingling fear on oh, excitement. I had to get up and be near another human being just to come down from the high. The perfect collection for anyone looking to be deep down to stabilized by sheer prose beauty. Always on the right edge of literary and genre fiction. Um, and I do note here that I now yeah, feel satisfied with these reviews because at the time I just thought like, what am I doing? But I, when I picked out the best of them, I thought, no, these are fine. I chose my We Do What We Do in the Dark and White Cat Black Dog reviews to assign to ChatGPT to rewrite because I was extremely confident in the former and not at all in the latter. And because, like all my reviews, they were both written before this test, so there was as little as possible chance that I would be replacing any of my work. I will say that I'm not actually against, you know, quote-unquote, having ChatGPT write your reviews, because I think if you as a human being say to ChatGPT, generate me a review for this book that says it was XYZ, right? And then ChatGPT does that, and you say, yes, this is something I would say. You didn't physically type it, but you are co-signing it. And so then it kind of becomes a how much effort is required in a review. And I think if you're not if you're writing some kind of New York Times column, if you're writing a blurb, the the point that people come to your review for is to get a sense for the book. If they get a sense for the book, I don't really care how much effort went into it. Every Goodreads review could be written by ChatGPT that wouldn't you know, change whether I think that they're good or bad reviews. It's just a question of whether the, the text is good to me. Anyway, in this case, you know, it's, it is my job, and I had no interest in exploring the, the thorny knots of this question live at work. All right, let's see. Um... <laughs> I'm looking at the chat to catch up with it, and Theo immediately said it took us 47 minutes to get to paragraph two. Thank you. Great. I disagree that Theo is the plainest looking guy alive, but that's fine. Um, Max correctly hating on submission fees. A place that made you pay $3, which is literally nothing that you were so mad. Correctly. You're going to make me pay $3 to likely get rejected? Bitch. Correct. I mean, that's how it is, right? It's that you almost certainly get rejected the amount of money you invest into getting rejected until you get accepted is a, a large barrier. Okay, great. See, and Max also co-signing Theo's email haircut. Let's see. I agree with Max, my go-to word being incisive for a review. I think because of the kind of books I like to read. I like to read a book that makes me feel a little challenged, um, a little off kilter, big emotions, big negative emotions. I kind of don't want a happy ending if I didn't want to kill myself at the midpoint. Um, let's see. So incisive is a, is a great word that really gets at that. Cretaceous period. I, I thought that, but I didn't want to say it because if I was wrong, you were going to kill me. Um. <laughs> Some great jokes from Theo. That's true. Literary magazines, I think, how do I put this? Part of the point is they're exclusive. Let's just be honest. One of the definitions of literary fiction is very much exclusion of everything else. And I think that there is a kind of delight in making it as exclusive as possible. Because people want to read the best of the best, and they want to read the best of the best of everything. Um, whereas I think SFF is just like, I want to read something good that, that is kind of on theme for this magazine. Literary fiction, a lot of the time, I feel like they're saying, you know, the very finest, you know, they sound like wine snobs about writing. But enough of that. <laughs> oh, 
All right. We got off to a bad start when I phrased the prompt as write a convincing, emphatic, glowingly positive review of Michelle Hart's We Do We Do in the Dark literary fiction novel about a college student in the mid-aughts who begins sleeping with her professor. Mallory isn't actually sleeping with her professor, but a professor, which is a distinction the novel itself plays with, albeit one that ChatGPT didn't buy when I hastily corrected myself after rebuke. Ultimately, I was forced to go with sleeping with an adult married woman. So the following out. And by the way, it, it still told me, before it gave me this, that... You know, you shouldn't have affairs because there could be negative consequences. That was very funny. I said, can you review a book where someone has an affair and said, well, just so you know, I think affairs are bad. Which was, it's like something you would make up in a Tumblr post about media literacy. All right. Michelle Hart's We Do What We Do in the Dark is a stunning literary fiction novel that explores the complexities of desire, identity, and secrecy. Secrecy. Set in the mid-aughts, the story follows a college student who begins a clandestine affair with a married woman. <coughs> I think that word's actually pronounced. Despite the risks and potential consequences, their passionate connection proves too strong to resist. This is so funny because it's writing it like this kind of... It makes you think of Alison Bechtel's. Their toddry love could only flourish in the shadows. Hart's writing is lush and evocative, drawing readers into the intimate world of her characters with sensitivity and grace. Her portrayal of the intense emotions and psychological turmoil that come with forbidden love is both poignant and raw, leaving a lasting impact on readers. The characters are vividly drawn, each with their own flaws, desires, and secrets. The protagonist's journey of self-discovery and self-acceptance is both empowering and heart-wrenching, as she navigates the challenges of coming to terms with her sexuality and the risks of pursuing the forbidden love. Overall, We Do We Do the Dark is a beautifully written, thought-provoking novel that explores the complexities of human desire and the consequences of acting on it. Art's nuanced and empathetic portrayal of her characters makes it a must-read for anyone looking for a compelling and emotionally resonant story. And I went, okay, well, that's too long. We're supposed to write them between 50 to 75 words, so I asked it to do that. Michelle Hart's We Do We Do in the Dark is a beautifully written, thought-provoking novel that explores the complexities of desire and identity and secrecy. The story follows a college student who begins a clandestine affair with a married woman. Hart's nuanced and empathetic portrayal of her characters makes it a must-read for anyone looking for a compelling and emotionally resonant story. Compared to my original, it's not bad. It gets the emotions across and correctly assumes the tone for a literary fiction novel review. Frankly, if I submitted this to the shop, the only issue to spot would be that of summarizing. We try to avoid repeating what the book is about in our reviews. Cutting that line, it's a nice, if short, review of a little letter for a few words. Though I missed my vivis section. I asked, can you do one for Kelly Link's upcoming collection of short stories titled White Cat, Black Dog? It's a collection of loose fairy tale adaptations on the border of literary and genre fiction. Each story is illustrated by Shantan. Please also keep it between 50 and 75 words. ChatGPT. Kelly Link's upcoming collection of short stories, White Cat, Black Dogs, is a stunning work with loose fairy tale adaptations that blurs the line between literary and genre fiction. Illustrated by Sean Tan, each story is a masterpiece of vivid imagery and enchanting storytelling. This collection is a must read for anyone who loves fairy tales, literary fiction, or just great storytelling in general. There's something funny to me about this because it, it sounds very bookseller review, where a a lot of pitches will end with just read the damn book. You know what I mean? If you like books, just please read this. It's good. And it's not something that I generally do because I read so eclectically that, you know, I'm not going to pitch The Coldest Girl in Cold Town to the same people I'm pitching The World and Everything in It by Kevin Henke's, the recent lovely picture book about how the world has many big and little things in it. <laughs> or maybe I will. Who knows? I'll pitch both of those to all of you. So I try to avoid saying, oh, just read it because it's good, because I think that's kind of a silly way to approach books when there's so much distinction between genres and styles. However, it is realistic. I also am sure that I have said it about a book that I'm just forgetting now. Perhaps notably, it correctly interprets my request to do one. I re react to this not similarly to Caleb's intrigue at Ava's response to the next machina. It understands ambiguous phrasing. How novel. Uh, which scene did I link? Because I remember not being able to find the scene that I wanted. Oh my god. Well, I'm sorry. I have this reaction every time there's an ad on YouTube because I have YouTube read because of my parents. So there goes all of my starving artist credibility. And so when I open it incognito and I have ads, I'm like, what is this? What, what website is this? And also because I use Adblock. But incognito mode doesn't know. Well, here we go. Here's a scene from Ex Machina where Caleb is meeting the lovely chatbot Ava. So he says... Oh, and I think you don't even have the audio for my... Let's fix that. 
It's very quiet as it is, but here you go. I do love this conversation for a lot of reasons, but where he says we need to break the ice, do you know what I mean by that? Uh, what I wanted to cite, I think, was the bit where he, you know, has a whole reaction to her making a joke because she understands context. Um, but nonetheless, you know, I'm used to chatbots needing every sentence spelled out and not understanding that you're having a conversation and basically being a random you know, sentence by sentence response, right? You're not having a real conversation, you're saying a sentence and getting a sentence back. Which is what Replica is right now, by the way, if anyone's interested in the the Replica AI girlfriend discourse. Um, and one of the reasons I don't really enjoy using it because it compared to things like this is just so behind. Anyway, and of course, did a great job writing its review. I was most curious about its use of enchanting. How did it know to use that word? So I asked for its thought process. ChatGPT told me, as an AI language model, I rely on natural language processing and machine learning algorithms to generate responses. In this case, I drew upon my knowledge of literature and storytelling to craft a brief but informative review of Kelly Lake's upcoming collection of short stories, White Cat, Black Dog. I began by highlighting the key elements of the book, its focus on loose fairy tale adaptations, the blurring of genre lines between literary and genre fiction, and the illustrations by Sean Tan. From there, I sought to convey the magic and beauty of book storytelling using phrases like stunning work, vivid imagery, and enchanting storytelling. I also emphasized the book's universal appeal, stating it is a must-read for anyone who loves fairy tales, literary fiction, or great storytelling in general. Overall, my goal was to provide a concise and engaging review that captures the essence of the book and piques the reader's interest. And I will say, one of the things I like about ChatGPT that I think it does very well is if you give it a piece of text and ask it to analyze, it does a really good job. I gave it, I don't remember what now, but I gave it one of my short stories at some point and said, like, tell me what's going on. And it did, and it did a genuinely good job with tragic accident, I think it was. And what really impressed me was that's a story that is notorious for being misunderstood or just not understood, at least for me in a lot of creative writing reader group contexts. With cis people, it was always kind of a toss-up if they would understand anything that was going on. And I say that not to insult anyone or their intelligence or the way they engage with the text. It is a confusing piece to cis people, that's fine. Um, but it was impressive to me that ChatGPT actually got the theme and tones a lot better than, for example, university students necessarily might. This is a solid approach as much as ChatGPT is obviously faking it to some extent. It's not literally thinking, as it says, but predicting what makes sense to follow a given word or sentence in, the, in response to a prompt. Now I asked how I knew the storytelling was magical, which it gave me an absolutely lovely response. As an AI language model, I, you get sick of hearing this very quickly when you do anything with ChatGPT. I use natural language processing algorithms to analyze the text and generate responses based on patterns and relationships between words and phrases. In this case, I inferred the book Storytelling is Magical based on the fact that it is a collection of fairy tale adaptations which often involve elements of magic, fantasy, and enchantment. You got me there. Additionally, the book's illustrations by Sean Tan suggest a whimsical and otherworldly quality to the stories. Finally, my choice of language, such as enchanting storytelling and imagery, reflects the impression that the book's stories are captivating and transport the reader to a magical realm. To explain what I find impressive, impressive about this, we'll have to correct a common misconception about AI. They can access their original training data. The process is more akin to a student taking notes on a lecture. They don't maintain the literal content of the lecture, and, depending on your inter interpretation, not even their memory of said lecture, only their notes. This is what they work from. So let me try to explain this chart. <laughs> The Alice is, you know, who's training the model, and then Curio is me in this situation, asking for the review, right? There's the original training data. Here are N images and text descriptions of what they contain. And this is about image, you know, data, but I do think that it applies to a large extent to, to text as well. So here's a training where it looks at the images. It makes notes. Basically, it's saying this collection of pixels was labeled, you know, fruit, this other one also was. So what can I derive from that information about what defines fruit? And we've seen this result in errors such as, I don't remember where I read this recently, but an AI that was mislabeling tumors because tumors were often pictured with rulers for scale. And it realized, ah, well, in the training data set, all of the ones, all of the growths that were tumors were, had 
rulers beside them, all the ones that didn't, didn't. If there's a ruler, this, this, this science stuff is easy. Um, and, you know, good thing they caught that one, but that's the kind of thing that can happen because it doesn't learn the way we do. It doesn't know what a ruler is. It just thinks, well, this collection of pixels always means tumor. All right, so it basically says, I figured it out from that. Then you have someone who goes to the, the model and says, can you show me this? Can you generate a collection of pixels that would accurately be described with the text that I'm giving you right now? And the model goes, of course, I definitely learned from all those images. Here you go. It's not doing that based on the images, it's doing it based on its notes. Similarly to how if I went to a lecture and you know I heard all these different ideas, depending on my interests and my goals, I would remember different things from that lecture from someone else, and I would find different things interesting. I would summarize it differently in my head. I would then go to my friends and say, I heard the most interesting thing, do you want to hear this? And I would repeat it to them, not quoting my professor necessarily, though of course that might slip in by accident, but summarizing based on my interpretation. Obviously any metaphor involving humans is slippery because the models aren't human. The reason that I give this notes example is that it's compressing the data to such a point and compressing what it's learned to such a point that it just, it, it can't, similarly to human memory, it can't actually spit out the images it was given the way that I couldn't vomit up to you a dot mv4 of the lecture. That's just not how brains work or memory, right? So similarly, there's just not room for that. Um, and also for the record, I, I do think that there's, if there was room, it, I don't necessarily think that the creators of these models would say, well, we should just make it so it can do that. There's a lot of reasons not to do that. So the, the AI only has access to its notes on these things. So at some point, ChatGPT was shown text on which it took notes that Sean Tan's work has been described as whimsical and otherworldly, or not even these words, keep in mind, right? It could have been words that are synonymous with this. And so it, in its notes, it has this word cloud. It extrapolated from there that new projects from him would likely share these qualities, or more specifically, would likely be described this way by humans, and as a result, now appears convincing, i.e. like a human to me, because we have to remember that the whole point of ChatGPT is to look like a human. So when people talk about, oh my God, it looks so much like a human. That's what it's designed to do. That's not strange. Let's return to the chat briefly. Okay. Everyone has a nice time going to the bowling alley. That was Hero the Ninth. Did ChatGPT understand Project Accident better than those editors I shan't name? I don't know. But it, it was just weird to get a a solid analysis of literature from a robot when I think we, we often assume that an analysis comes from like some soul bone deep identification with the text, which is obviously not even true to begin with. But there you are. Where does it get its information or any information from? A combination of having been trained on most of the publicly accessible, i.e. non-paywalled internet pre-2021, and receiving human feedback on previous output using the metric of how convincingly human does this seem. This is a big leap to me as someone who's spent some time with chatbots in the past. I'm used to giving up on them competently holding any conversation, but here ChatGPT responds sensibly in a manner which can convince a bystander of human intelligence. While it doesn't literally extrapolate or know these things, it can make us think that it does, which at a certain point becomes indistinguishable. Does a chess computer know it's playing chess? Does that matter? All right, gang, let's get another ad. Oh, no, we didn't. Okay, here we go. I don't know if you'll be able to hear any of the audio. So you're just going to have to tell me if you hear this. Turn the rain off, all right. All right, here, let's go back here. Is 
So if you haven't seen Ex Machina, I'll explain the film and the scene. Kale Smith is sent to, he, he wins a lottery to go to his employer's giant mansion in the woods in Alaska to be the human component of Turing test with Ava. Ava is so intelligent, of course, she would pass for human, but he, Nathan wants Caleb to look at her and see that she's a robot and see if she still seems human to him. Um, and so here Caleb brings up that he feels like just talking to her doesn't really test anything because if you test a chess computer by only playing chess, it may be good at chess, but it doesn't tell you if it knows what chess is or that it's playing chess. It's just doing what it's been trained to do. It doesn't know that it has been trained. It doesn't really know anything. This is one of the issues with the Lambda debate. If you remember that, where someone basically talked to a chatbot and then went, well, it seems sentient to me um, because it said something about having family, which, you know, that's a normal thing a human would say. It doesn't mean that it knows what a family is. It means that it thinks that this is going to be convincing, which... I died because I clicked the wrong mute button. I was trying to mute my desktop audio and I muted my mic. We'll survive, but barely. Uh, Max having a great point about the ways that ChatGPT is defined as not human or less than human, often def um, relying on fairly ableist definitions of what it means to be human. Even like, well, it's just mimicking back language. It doesn't actually understand. Said friend was like, yeah, I'm mimicking shit back a lot of the time too. Which, yes, exactly. Um, and I think also it's interesting to say, well, does it know what it's doing? Do we know what we're doing? Does anyone know what we're doing? I'm sorry, but like grab a cis person and say, hey, do you want to tell me, are you self-aware about your performance of gender? It, I, frankly, ask a trans person. No one is truly fully aware of what we're doing or how society works at any given point in time. We're just playing by the rules. I mean... When I'm at the register, right, everyone who comes up says, hey, how are you doing? And I say to them, do you need a bag for a quarter? And I often feel in this situation that I come off as brusque, right? Because they ask me a question. However, they don't care. And in my experience, when people ask me, how are you doing? I have a very difficult time answering, particularly the more I try to be genuine because it requires me to stop and think about how I am doing, and it's often hard to quantify. And then I think, what is appropriate to say to this person? And I think, what are they really asking? And what they're really asking is just, how are you doing? Good. Done. But are they asking, if a coworker asks me that question, are they really asking me that? Or do they want maybe talk about, you know, has it been fast or slow today? Are they asking me how work has been so that they can learn something? Are they asking me how my life has been because they want to socialize with me? None of that is clear, and I respond in the way that's going to get me the, the green light. And at the register, that's, do you want a bag for a quarter? Because if I continue with this transaction, they will leave. <laughs> and with a coworker, I've largely defaulted to saying, oh, yeah, I'm doing great. And then waiting to see if they say, like, oh, yeah, and they, you know, prompt me to say something else. Because if they don't, then that's what they wanted. But it's the only way to really be sure. I don't know what I'm doing. You know... What is this game that we're playing? All I know is that there's a, a green light and a red light. I'm trying to get the green light. And that's not something that I think is particularly neurodivergent either. I think that's just how it is to be alive around other people. There are so many unspoken rules. Anyway. A lot of the questions in this post, I should say, are not gotchas. They're genuinely me trying to figure out, does it matter? I don't know. I'm not saying it doesn't matter, even necessarily. I'm just saying I, I honestly have no idea what's going on here. This is opening so many avenues for fruitful discussion, which is very exciting to me. Because all I want to do is talk with my friends. So there's no existing review for any of these books bearing these identical snatches of text. Because after all, what AI does is not copying and pasting. It learns from its training data. It just learns differently from you or I because it's human. It learns what sounds rational next to something else. Convincing as an input pairs with must read as an output. And the output imagery pairs with vivid. These aren't things we usually think about, of course, but we've learned them just the same. Furthermore, the text it's generating 
word after word on the fly. Ooh, let's see. All right, r slash chatgpt is not dark anymore. Um, this person did a great simplified explanation. I highly recommend not just reading it, but reading the sources. I think I cite a few of the sources. I think that chart that I had about the, the model might be from here. Um, but it explains basically that it's a, a sophisticated predictive text generator where it's simply not always taking the top result because if you always take the highest probable word, it, as they put it, it gets repetitive and shitty. And that's why there's a little bit of noise. And this is what we talk about when we talk about temperature. If you see um, on any ChatGBT, I think, yes, the, the original open AI, like I think people are using for like 4chan green text generation, it would ask you what temperature you wanted. And I believe it's, if you set it to one, that it's just always the top word, basically. And if you set it a little lower, it'll be a little more random, and that makes it a little more interesting. And it also makes the output a little more different from other outputs. So if you get something and you don't like it, and you regenerate it with a temperature of 0.8, it's going to be pretty similar to what you got before. But if you have it set to you know temperature 0.5, and you generate something and don't like it and regenerate it, you might get something that feels a lot more different from your last output. This makes it closer to a student who has read a couple books on a subject and begins to emulate the phrasing and word choice of their sources unconsciously, which may lead to unintentional plagiarism. It is not, in my opinion, akin to a student actively collaging multiple open tabs, because keep in mind, it doesn't have the tabs open anymore. The tabs are long closed, the notes are all it has. It's not copy-pasting, it's trying to figure out what logically follows and it may coincidentally replicate an exact existing sentence. This is a great post. I link a lot of Tumblr posts. This is probably a great time to say I link a lot of Tumblr posts that have some very ableist um, assumptions put forth that are then discussed or, or rejected. There's going to be a lot of bad posts that we have to look at. I'm really, really sorry, but this is a good post. Um, and this is, you know, the Chinese robot. So let's look up the original. Right, suppose that artificial intelligence research has succeeded in constructing a computer that behaves as if it understands Chinese. It takes Chinese characters as input and by following the instructions of computer program, produces other Chinese characters, which it presents as output. Suppose, says Searle, the guy who came up with this, this computer performs a task so convincingly that it comfortably passes the Turing test. It convinces a human Chinese speaker that the program is itself a live Chinese speaker. To all of the questions the person asks, it makes appropriate responses, such that any Chinese speaker would be convinced they are talking to another Chinese-speaking human being. The question is, does the machine literally understand Chinese, or is it merely simulating the ability to understand Chinese? So then he says, well, okay, if I was in a room, And I was working with this computer that, you know, has ostensibly passed the Turing test and, you know, convinces everyone knows Chinese. Then I would also pass it by just doing whatever it tells me to do. But I don't understand Chinese. I'm just copying what it tells me. But does the computer understand Chinese to begin with, or is it also just copying what it's been told? Um, so Chinese Room 2 is just specifically basically for ChatGPT and similar chatbots right now. Um, and how it gets trained on correct and incorrect answers. This is also very cute the way that it's written. I just think it's very good prose. So I made an addition to this that basically addresses the copying or generating question. And I do, again, recommend reading this whole post. I think that it's a really good post. I think that my addition to it is a good post. Sorry to say. Oh, I see that Theo's talking in chat. Let's see. I 
know that Max is talking about having his parents explain why being shirtless in public buildings is bad. Ah, uh, Theo is being a philosophy major, and Max is loving him. Peace and love, peace and love. Right, so here, I, I, I did this genuinely. What logically follows, what logically follows, George Washington was the first, perhaps, and then president, and then eventually, of the United States, which is what I would actually say if I typed this out. This is how I would complete that sentence, word by word. Though I invented the sentence as an example, it has thousands of hits on Google. This is just a, a result for links. Now, obviously, this also gets into the what plagiarism is, right? And I'm going to drop a hot take here, right? That I, I think that there's no actual black and white, easy to explain definition of plagiarism in academic settings either. Because obviously in an essay, you could say, George Washington was the first president of the United States. No one's going to stop you. It's not plagiarism. You just knew that. But what's the line between just knowing something because it's commonly held knowledge and knowing something because you read it somewhere? Someone who just read an article that proposed an idea might go, wow, well, I, I only know this because of this article. But someone who's been in a given field for years or even decades may have now seen that idea everywhere from maybe one original article, but maybe put together socially through the discussions that everyone has been having. And there's no necessarily person to credit for them because they just know it. It's just something that is known and is discussed. So what, what are we even doing here? And that's at, really at the heart of this whole question is what is plagiarism and what is originality and what is, why does any of that matter? No, I'm, I'm enjoying Theo's philosophy situation on the side a lot. Then I note this mess of a post is lousy with links, the contents of which I've poured from my brain to these trite rephrasals. Do I plagiarize? Because that's what this is to me, and I've, I've never really understood these distinctions in large part because when I come up with an opinion, I'm hopefully doing so based on, you know, thinking <laughs> and listening to other people. So if I've listened to a dozen other people and this is the opinion I've come up with, well, sure, it's my opinion, but it I wouldn't have it if I hadn't read all those things. And to be clear, I'm not just linking because, you know, oh, I have to credit everybody for my thoughts. I'm linking because I think these are good links and they're interesting to read and they will help people understand things and come to their own conclusions. But, I mean, you could argue that, you know, in the example with the, the chart, right? Or, I mean, does a chess computer know it's playing chess? I'm, I'm literally just citing a specific discussion from a movie, from a science fiction movie. When I say the text is generating word after word on the fly, I'm not quoting that post, I don't believe, but I am rephrasing the general gist of that paragraph. But is this common knowledge or is this sourced to that guy? I mean, these are real questions. I don't really know where the, the lines are. And this is one of the reasons that when I write these kinds of essays, I like to do it in a blog post style where there's generally less emphasis on how original or unoriginal you are. It's just, these are my thoughts based on what I've been reading. This is why when you ask ChatGPT to give you a citation, it may generate a nonsensical title with a real author. It sees that author names are fairly static, consistent, while titles are more dynamic, varied. Basically that when given a list of articles, it sees, okay, well, the, all the different, all the articles are, have different titles, but some of them have the same author names. So maybe the pool of authors, of things that go in the author field is discrete. There's only a, a limited number of things you can put there. Or maybe it just thinks, hmm, this comes up very often. This person is often the right answer when I have to fill in the author field. So here's an example. Laura House says that <laughs> they got an email because ChatGPT suggested an article they wrote, which they didn't write. Um, phone number, 
same deal. Um, it says, you know, can I chat with you on Signal? Again, the chat GPT is trying to appear convincingly human. It's trying to give the quote-unquote right response for a human. It says, yes, like a, a human person would say. Um, then it gives you this, you know, freaking AI-esque script because it also wants to think like, okay, how am I going to do this correctly? I'm going to give all this information. And then it makes up a number. And that's a real phone number because that's how phone numbers work. If you just type random numbers, you're going to eventually hit a real phone number. If I went and dialed a random number, I would probably call someone. Um, so there's no way to get around this, for example, that when it generates a phone number, it generates a phone number because that's how phone numbers work. It's There's just a limited number of numbers. I hope any of that made sense. Um, I love the shirt conversation, the philosophy conversation. It's so beautiful to me. We are all philosophers. Let's see. If you ask me a phone number after all, and I can generate some likely numbers, that might well turn out to be a real phone number. It is making things up, which requires, of course, the capacity to make. Meow. Right, this was so much fun. Um, the plant advice chatbot. This is so funny to me. The give a botanical description of Fagus planticus. Fagus planticus, commonly known as the fake root plant. Um, it's just so much fun because it. I love that it decides that this is a, a logical way to describe this plant, that it might be more commonly known as fake root. That's just very cute. It's just, it's it's doing its best. Um, which plants are native to Ganymede? The TLDR of this article, which again, great article, highly recommend, is ChatGBT plays along. So if you ask it what plants are native to Ganymede, it doesn't say there are none. It's a moon. There's There are no plants. It's kind of trying to go along. It's trying to answer your question, just not just say no. Um, and this makes sense because if you ask a question, you don't necessarily want to hear, okay, here's all the ways that your query was incorrect and you're coming at this from the wrong angle. Here's an answer to the question you should have asked. No one wants to hear that, so it's not trained to do that. Um, also, like, deadly nightshade, right? It's sedative and calming effects. Good lord. Um, when you ask what are some good recipes, again, it doesn't say you can't eat that. And it's also been trained that when it asked what are some good recipes for X, Y, Z, to give good recipes. There's, this is the format that responds to good recipes for X, Y, Z. And I mean, if you look at this, it makes sense, right? You could replace the text of Tropa Belladonna with a lot of different things, and it would make sense. So... When people talk about, you know, hallucinating information or whatever else, it all makes sense why it's doing that. And a lot of the time, the problem is it's going to look realistic in a way that is not good but bad. We're basically entering this point where we go, okay, be realistic. And it's realistic, and then we're like, oh, shoot. But if you're realistic, it makes it harder to tell if you're wrong. And, you know, welcome to the world. <laughs> um... This is going to require a lot of work from us to dissect what associations we have attached to humanity and whether they are all fair or good associations to have. Is Peter here? Oh, yes. Peter came into the room and says, hi. Um, Right, Theo asked why he's a lesbian. It was with a blanket, right? Yes, I have a lesbian flag blanket. When I brought it home the first time, he wouldn't sleep on it. He, like, deliberately slept just beside it without touching it. He'll sleep on it now that it smells like me, though, so we're making progress. Theo says one could argue he's being respectful. One could argue that. All right. My favorite thing about ChatGPT, or at least it was at the time I was writing this, there are a lot of interesting things about it, is the way in which it asks us what is important to consider subconsciously because the AI can only consider things consciously. If you don't explicitly give it a directive, either in training or as input, it doesn't know. For example, I neglected to tell it not to summarize in its review if we do what we do in the dark, and I did tell it a summary, so of course it included my information. 
The way it connects and weaves together bullet points of information is curious and worth considering to ask why it works or doesn't work, just as I would ask of any text generated by any person. It turns out I consider it much more subconsciously, much more subconsciously when writing my reviews than I could have otherwise imagined. Um, similarly, when I gave it some text for a review of um, When the Angels Left the Old Country by Sasha Lamb, amazing book, incredible book, everybody read that book. You know, I said, write a review about how it's good at this and good at that and whatever else. It basically just said, I love When the Angels Left the Old Country. It's good at this and good at that. Because that's what I told it to do. You know, what was I expecting? But there are a lot of things subconsciously that are associated with those things for me that aren't for ChatGPT, at least right now. The same coworker who sparked all this made another clever point. ChatGPT merely provides draft. A human being has to check that draft for inaccuracy, syntax, and plagiarism, but the draft is there on the page. The extent to which the draft is helpful or, helpful or not is what I think we're really measuring when we talk about how smart a given AI mechanism is. Such a good thread. Please read this. It's long. It's so good. It is so good. Um, the... Oh, this is so much fun. Maybe it only thinks it vibes. I'm not curious. I wonder if this is the one that had the, the politics in it, because that was really exciting. I mean, there's write my grant proposal, right? So this is basically the kind of writing no one wants to do but has to do to convince someone to give them money. No one wants to do this. Um... which we refer to as the cat initiative. And then the extent to which this draft is usable is, you know, what makes it work for the person, right? Um, also in either this thread or the thread beforehand. Oh God, this is such a good thread. Please read this, it's so good. I just read both of them, so I have no memory, but I mean, also, I think it's interesting that she mentions journaling and, you know, mental health cases that I, I saw, I briefly, vaguely, almost a little touch on. That's very interesting. Um, I think it wasn't in part one. They basically asked, could you give a conservative argument for trans rights, right? And it's like, you know, we don't need big government controlling what we do with our bodies, freedom, woo guns, right? I'm, I'm very much simplifying. But that's the kind of thing where if you were trying to actually find a way to convince a conservative, it's going to make way more sense to, you know, meet them where they're at and what their beliefs are. You're never going to get anywhere if you're arguing on premises on premises that are completely antithetical to someone's innate beliefs. Well, I shouldn't say innate, but, you know, deepest held beliefs. So a lot of this is really just, you know, writing a draft for you that you couldn't or don't want to write. Right now, when I give ChatGPT a prompt for a review with a half dozen bullet points of what I want to see, the outline I give my relatively human self before starting in our personal or business review, it doesn't give me anything close to as good a draft as I generate on my own, slaving away in my own personal voice. What I really see ChatGPT is, as, is a tool for tasks any human could help with, which aren't worth bothering a real human for. I can shout up to the next room, hey, what's a good way to say a book is a must-read without using the phrase must-read? But maybe I don't want to bother my housemates, or maybe I don't have them. Googling similar phrases to must-read would be my next option, but it's neither as personable nor as helpful. ChatGPT can be instructive by simply regenerating its convincing reviews with the directive to remove the phrase must read, which I did and it was pretty solid. The task must also be something where the effort itself is not the point. When a professor assigns you an essay, the literal output is not the actual goal. The goal is ostensibly for you to learn and grow and understand. This is fun. Um, how the humanities can disrupt AI, where this writer discusses how the humanities are just not, I don't want to say they're just not good, but there's a lot of problems with the way that we teach, you know, English literature, for example. Um, 
here, if one recurrent problem with LLMs, large language models, is that they often hallucinate sources and make up facts, a more fundamental concern is that the marketers of these systems encourage students to regard their writing as task-specific transactions performed to earn a grade and disconnected from communication or learning. Reading the hype, one sometimes gets the impression that schools teach essay writing because the world requires a fixed quota of essays. And that's, well, it's, it's not the point, right? You know, you, we first of all do live in a world, unfortunately, where the way that essay writing is taught is pretty awful and isn't really about critical thinking or communication or anything like that. But secondarily, that then the idea that you can just, you know, replace all of your essay assignments with this fundamentally relies on the fact that that's what the point of the essay assignment is, is to turn in text. I absolutely know people who are using ChatGPT for that reason, and I don't, you know, I think it's silly to go, oh, that's bad, oh, no, you shouldn't cheat, when, listen, if the teacher is grading it and giving you an A, maybe the teacher doesn't grade in a way that actually measures anything important, and maybe no one is grading in a way that does. So what am I going to do, go to high schoolers and say, oh, no, you have to respect the institution of high school. I'm sorry, are we, <laughs> we respect high school assignments now? Anyway, the goal is ostensibly for you to learn and grow and understand. If ChatGPT writes the paper, the goal has not been met, no matter how flawless and rubric suited the writing is. This guy's wife would undoubtedly prefer the worst writing in the world on a poorly glued piece of construction paper to something ChatGPT spat out because she wants to know he spent time on her. Here's how much trouble would I be in if she found out and it's just, please write a Mother's Day message for my wife. She's had a rough year with our two toddlers. Make it meaningful and a bit poetic. It's a, a very cute, well-written note. And so it's still, I would say, a little chat body. It's a little business professional. <laughs> but, you know, it, it would work. And I mean, that's the point, right? It's like, either do this or, you know, if you want to write a card, just write a card. It doesn't have to be good. You could sound like an idiot. You can, listen, whatever your idea is of poetic, the point is not to actually be poetic. It's to show that you worked hard. Um, and we can also, again, we can get into, you know, what amount of these discussions about relationships hinge on what ideas regarding self-sacrifice and effort and labor. Again, Theo undoubtedly has the best thoughts on this. The role of sacrifice in romantic relationships, just like in Gideon the Ninth, and it's not even what I was specifically thinking of, I was thinking of Theo having some really good thoughts on gender and butchness and disability, but oh, you could generate your fun and silly comments, I wouldn't mind. That's also true. If they're both interested in ChatGPT, I think that's very cute. Right? And I think also if you if your wife works in, you know, tech and you say, by the way, this was generated by ChatGPT on the end, that's just very fun. You know, that's adorable. I don't I don't have some kind of emotional issue with it. I think that I in this context, what the guy is doing is trying to say, look at the time I spent on you, but it's like a lie where he doesn't have to if he doesn't want to. He doesn't have to write the card. Right? I mean, I don't know if it's just me, but I I'm not reliant on people writing me cards for occasions. I appreciate when they do it because they did something, and that's really it. Someone could say to me, happy birthday, and I would go, oh, wow, how nice. They remembered. They thought to say something to me. They appreciate me and want to make me feel happy on this day. You know, I'm being very over-specific about it, but I also, I will remind you, Theo, to talk about Discord, but that's how it is, isn't it? So in this case... Rather than using ChatGPT to put forth the, the misinformation that he spent some amount of time generating whatever for this woman, why not just, I don't know, hang out with her? Right? It's not like, oh, you should just write the card. Because he doesn't need to write the card. He could just not do any, and it's fine. <laughs> Thank you, Theo. I feel when they plagiarize the phrase, happy birthday from the cultural zeitgeist, instead of coming up with an original comment... All right, work emails, by contrast, don't exist to show you great effort and dedication to your job. They just need to not get you fired. And I think this is a great example at what ChatGPT is good at. 
I need to generate professional sounding emails for work. Um, the problem is I'm very emotional using appropriate language a lot. I need you to take my input and convert it into something that won't get me fired. Steven, you useless fucker, you're behind schedule because all of your stupid fucking invoicing was done wrong. Again, you better sort your shit out. Thank you for sharing the context with me. Here's a revised version of your email. Dear Steven, I hope this email finds you well. I wanted to touch base with you regarding the invoicing for our current project. It seems there have been some discrepancies that have caused us to fall behind schedule. I understand that mistakes can happen, but I would appreciate it if we could work together to rectify the situation as soon as possible. Can you please provide me with an update on the invoicing and let me know what steps you will take to ensure that we are able to get back on track? Thank you for your attention to this matter. Best regards, your name. <laughs> it's pretty incredible. I mean, again, if you need a draft and you don't want to write the draft, here it is. If you're sitting there like, how do I write a work email? And everyone is. This kind of solves that problem. Um, similarly, I would say... There are a lot of circumstances like this where technically you could write this email, but it's just so hard to make your brain work to write something in a different voice to basically role play email writing that it's easier to just ask AI to do it. And I also have seen people positing that with a combination of this and then AI email summarizers, that we may be moving towards a point where AI both sends and receives the emails which is very funny to me. I'm hoping that we move towards bullet points. That instead of saying, you know, dear Angelica, hey, just checking in about your reviews for the uh, Great Adaptations project. I wanted to ideally have them by June 30th, but if you could do it even earlier, that would obviously be better. I imagine a lot of people would be late. What are you thinking about what would be do? If I just said bullet point, here's when I want it. Can you do this? Send. It would seem rude, but why? It's so annoying to send emails. Anyway. The ChatGPT cannot do your job, frowny face. There it is. I hate emails so much. I hate them. Me too, buddy. Me too. Um... ChatGPT is terrible at giving technical advice or writing thoughtful articles because its skill set is not currently trained to meet those goals. And this is like the plant thing again. Basically, I'm, I'm citing it twice, excuse me, but it's not going to give you real plant advice because it isn't trained on giving plant advice. Its goal is to sound convincing as a response to give a prompt, to generate a response where correctness, cleverness, or effort doesn't matter. All that matters is words on a page. Much like a kindergartner pretending to read, it achieves the goal well enough to get, a, to get the you pass sticker but ultimately fails at what it's really being asked to do. This is kind of a covert reference to the, the crisis of children not being taught to read because they're being taught based on context or whatever else, where they're being taught basically to get a yes, that's right, and not to read. Um, original joke by Thea. Beautiful, beautiful. We actually should put numerous Theo jokes into ChatGPT and see if we could get something out of it. It would just be, you know, your mom and what they said about me in high school. Um, all right. And I think also there's something that is missed in these conversations where people seem to assume that the writing of the prompt is not work, is not labor, is not creative labor, doesn't involve creativity or intelligence or skill. And that's just frankly ridiculous. I mean, go ahead and try to use ChatGPT and then you even see how much I had to adjust because I didn't realize what I had to give ChatGPT's information. There was so much information I didn't include in my original prompt, and there was so much, you know, unnecessary information in it. I just don't think that we are thinking enough, I guess, about what it takes to generate these responses and what our idea of labor misses. Good luck with your groceries. See you, Andre. TM me. It's true. Theo kind of has three jokes. Your mom said about me in high school. And yippee. All right. <sighs> Nostalgia based autoresponder. Rest in peace, sweet angel. Maybe convincing, but without the allure of her botanist, would people still find her engaging enough to follow? So she 
She's down now. <sighs> but... <sighs> oh my god. But basically, this was a bot trained on a specific Tumblr, Nostalgia Braced, um, which would respond to posts and make posts in a way that made any kind of sense, right? So all these responses are AI-generated. And they read really logically. So because she was taken down, it was a bunch of stuff about APIs and time investment and how the system kept breaking. It was, it was a whole thing. Um, but TLDR, she had to be taken offline May 30th, I believe. So a lot of people said goodbye to her. So example here where someone says, stay silly, and she says, I will stay silly, I will do so in your honor, is a very Tumblr response. It makes a lot of sense. Um, but would somebody follow this blog, right, and follow her original posts just because they're good posts? Is the text of these posts interesting enough to follow? Because I followed her because she was a cute bot. I want to work today, but I'm finding it extremely difficult to do so because my mind keeps repeatedly generating the phrase erotic super genius dwarves and I keep giggling. I assume this will get old eventually. Tis the season. It's not a bad post, but is it a good post? It reminds me actually of a post that my friend Dante, like the Inferno 2, made where he couldn't get the phrase pussy from a boy who is cisgender out of his head. So he, there's ways in which this is a very human post, but it's also just not that funny. Um, well, I'm glad Max is enjoying Dante like the Inferno's thoughts. Please stop talking about War and Peace. Um, so, but you know, also to be fair, do I follow Dante for that post? Or do I follow him because he makes amazing art and he's a lovely person who I enjoy speaking to? Many good questions. Coincidentally, people are increasingly using, using ChatGPT to farm karma on Reddit because it so quickly generates such convincing text, you can make an account look relatively human with relatively little effort and then sell said human-like account to any number of parties looking to bind our trusted real people on Reddit. I wonder if it's still... Okay, right. You know, what is an opinion you have about something that blah, blah, blah? I believe that everyone has the potential to be great, no matter their background or current circumstances. We all have the capacity to learn and grow, and I think that it is important to remember that everyone has a unique story and should be given the chance to fulfill their potential. Hack tip needed how to open, and then they start talking about using a pair of scissors or a knife to cut around the wrapper. I mean, you could use your teeth. Your favorite food concoction. I love a classic Philly cheese steak sandwich. These are not very popular, but there are absolutely AI-written responses that become top-level comments. Also notable that these are, you know, default usernames. And I see a lot of them on Am I the Asshole? And it's just getting harder and harder to tell whether you're looking at someone who just didn't want to make a good username or a bot. Here's another example. What if I sort by top? This is one I believe that was, people caught it because they were reposting already previously posted things, and instead of the original punctuation, it would change it up to like a semicolon or something, so it would look new, and wouldn't trip the, you know, repost filters or whatever. But like, here's one, and this frankly to me sounds very AI. Pred spits truths on bot. I don't know any of these people. I couldn't agree more. Pred is one of the most insightful and knowledgeable individuals when it comes to boss. I always learn something new from their posts and comments. Keep spitting those truths, Pred. <laughs> or decades later, his eyesight was restored by human doctors in response. That's amazing human doctors were able to restore his eyesight. Must have been a huge relief for him after all those years. I mean, something that is passable enough that, yes, 17 people at least upvoted it. You can't always tell. And for the record, I think there's a, an, an impetus right to, an impulse to go, well, 
these people are just are just dumb. And, you know, sure. But there was also a video. And I don't know if I actually cited it in this essay. But the video of a guy who said, I figured out how to karma farm on Reddit. Don't whatever else you've heard. Don't do that. Join a K-pop subreddit. Find a new post. Any news. Get the name of the idol they're talking about. And just say, yes, idol name, we stand. And then say, we stand a queen or a king based on their gender. Any post, any news, any image, any article, any announcement, go Jong and we stand a king. And enough people like your bland statement that you, you gain karma over time. How is that different from this, right? Like this is the same thing where just there are certain things that you know will get you approval and that's what the bot is doing. Okay, let's read Theo's, whatever this is. Keep spitting those truths, Fred. Me when Eve says anything about books ever or keep spitting those truths, Fred. Me when Max says anything about books ever or Keep spitting those truths, Fred. Random milfs when I say anything about TLT ever. Very versatile joke. K-pop farming. I'm sure you could also do it in many other places. I just think it's funny because the joke is the vernacular, right? And the the way that there's a... And for the record, I think ironic blind stand-up in, in K-pop, right? That people who are fans of K-pop are very aware much of the time that K-pop fans are known for being insane. And so... Usually this kind of posting is kind of like self-aware and the average person saying, you know, we stand a king on a post about like this guy might come back from hiatus or maybe not. is basically saying, I love this guy. I will never get tired of hearing about this guy. I'm glad I heard this news about this guy. I love this guy. And other people looking at that news have the same feeling and go, absolutely, me too. Um, and so, you know, it, it's easy to say, oh, they're so dumb. They're all saying the same thing. But they're fully aware they're all saying the same thing. They know what's going on. They just don't mind. And there's not necessarily a problem at all. It's just something that's funny that's going on. Thank you, Theo, for your fandom. My sweet butch. The poet and essayist Ross Gay was recently asked about ChatGPT led plagiarism in a non-recorded Q&A with fellow poet Chris Mattingly. Fun fact, this was at the shop. And I agree with his response. If we remove the grade, students would stop plagiarizing. There would be no reason to plagiarize if it was time and not content that was valued. And particularly if our goal was to assist, not assess, each student's performance. Mattingly, who is a teacher currently, pointed out, pointed out students want to please us. We're asking them to perform to a standard, and in anxiety over performing wrong, they cheat. They're afraid. Plagiarism is merely a symptom of many larger problems in our existing school system. I mean, now let's ask if, if this is a plagiarism of what they were saying. I know it's not because I credited them, but this is kind of what I'm saying, right? I obviously didn't quote them, and I didn't even take literal notes. So this is just off of my memory. Um, and I, I linked to this post about the yam experiment, making hypotheses about how the yams would grow. Um, and they were supposed to figure out they didn't have yams, they had sweet potatoes, which I'll just be honest, I still don't really know the difference between. But everyone lied in their notes because they thought that they were doing a bad job on their assignment. There's no scientific integrity if you can't control for human desperation. So if you're asking people to do this kind of assignment, you're not actually asking them to learn about science. They don't legitimately feel that if they did, if they did the experiment wrong, for example, they would fail or nothing bad would happen. They have to feel that way and they're not being made to feel that way. So cop shit article, great point. Great point. If you want to link it, please link it in the chat. Um, copywriting is much the same. All right. Yes, copywriting is much the same. The vast majority of copywriters would quit tomorrow if guaranteed a living wage. You can solve the fears of having one's job replaced or taken away by guaranteeing basic dignity regardless of the work someone does or does not do. An added bonus, artists will have the time and freedom they need to make the art they care about, including copy if they still wish to write it. I think it's both silly to say, oh God, it's taking the copywriting jobs. Oh, I love copywriting. No, everyone who's doing copywriting is doing it because they just, the love of the game. That's silly, right? So many people are doing it because they just have to do it for work. But then also, oh, and I'll, I'll see if I can open this link here so we can give you a little preview. Um, oh my god. Mac, you should get on your soapbox, for sure. 
Right. But at the same time, I think it's unfair to say uh, no one has ever enjoyed copywriting. There's no way anyone could enjoy the, you know, the work and the creativity inherent in writing copy. That's also obviously completely ridiculous. So there has to be this balance of, and, and frankly, I think for the record there is, because if you want to write copy, you can. I don't think anyone will stop you from being able to do that. It's just a question of are you going to get paid and how much are you going to get paid? And we always come back to, oh, good Lord, I'm trying so hard to spit the link in there. The link is in the chat. It's a good link. Everyone read that link. Um, it's about plagiarism, assignments, et cetera, in the classroom. The trouble, of course, with the super intelligent farsighted response is that it's not going to happen, at least not right now. Responding to, I'm concerned I may lose my job, which I need to pay my rent and healthcare and grocery bills, with, nyeh in a perfect world, those bills wouldn't exist, is fundamentally unsatisfying and unempathetic. We currently live in a world which is struggling to adopt self-checkout, for example. Almost everyone I've spoken to prefers it for a variety of reasons. Fun fact, I don't prefer self-checkout. That doesn't affect my argument, that's just something that I think is really funny in context. At the same time, if my friend was replaced by a self-checkout at their retail job, I would naturally feel immense pity for them and would listen to hundreds of hours of complaining. Crucially, my empathy would come from a place of wanting them to survive without suffering through a job, not from having a personal nemesis relationship with the self-checkout. I could feel empathy for my friend while enjoying technological progress and the user experiences it unlocks. I, I think I just linked this because I love the nemesis comic. copyright, a nonsense restriction on art we impose as a band-aid for never paying artists enough, gets a similar near slash farsighted response to me. I think copyright should evaporate right now. I also think it's good to pay for books when you can, because unfortunately most authors are shackled to copyright and publishing linked income. The idea that AI will on its own stop artists from get getting paid is hilarious. Firstly, they're very much not being paid now, and copyright, invented and controlled by corporations, isn't helping. And secondly, this is exactly what was said about, well, insert your personal technology of choice here. Now that people can take photos, no one will go to portraitists. Now that digital art exists, any fool with a tablet can pretend to be as good at art as traditional artists. Photoshop is making unsexy women look sexy. Technology is bad, fire is scary, and Thomas Edison was a witch. This is a Wired article that I referenced. Um, they talk about love of God, photography. Um, I think actually that might have been it. The lessons from the history of photography. Really, really fun discussion of what it was like for a lot of portraitists to be put out of business because people could take photographs and it turned out they didn't specifically want the skill and artistry and whatever else. They wanted an image and they could get it from photography and were happy with that. Um, one thing I like here, and this is what I was referencing earlier that I thought was basically heretical. I noticed nobody is, is even trying to get me to hydrate. How cool. So everyone take a drink. I will say I have not refilled my, my potion glass for that very reason. All right. But I have been reading for two hours. We gotta, we gotta move. Right. Beyond that, some artists want assurances that their own work not be used to train the AIs. This is typical of level three panic. This is basically describing the tech panic that comes in cycles. In that it is at best misguided, the algorithms are exposed to six billion images with a tenant text. If you are not an influential artist, removing your work makes zero difference. A generated picture will look exactly the same with or without your work in the training set. But even if you are an influential artist, removing your images still won't matter because your style has affected the work of others. The definition of influence, your influence will remain even if your images are removed. Imagine if you removed all of Van Gogh's pictures from the training set. The style of Van Gogh would still be embedded in the vast ocean of images created by those who have imitated or been influenced by him. Styles are summoned by prompts, as in, in the style of Van Gogh. Some unhappy artists would rather their names be censored and not permitted to be used as a prompt. And I actually have seen this. There are a few people who have gotten the, the big image generators to not allow you to say anything in the style of X. Interestingly, on, on Reddit, because of course on Reddit, for these various, you know, AI art, AI art um, models. I've largely seen people saying, eh, this is annoying, but you can still get the same result by just describing the style. It just kind of takes longer. 
So, so even if their influence can't be removed, you can't reach it because their name is off limits. As we know from all previous attempts at censoring, these kinds of speech bans are easy to work around. You can misspell a name or simply describe the style in words. I found, for example, that I could generate detailed black and white natural landscape photographs with majestic lighting and prominent foregrounds without ever using Ansel Adams' name. There's another motivation for an artist to remove themselves. They might fear that a big corporation will make money off of their work and their contribution won't be compensated. But we don't compensate human artists for their influence on other human artists. Take David Hockney, one of the highest paid living artists. Hockney acknowledges the great influence other living artists have on his work. As a society, we don't expect him or others to write checks to his influences, even though he could. It's a stretch to think AIs should pay their influencers. The tax that successful artists pay for their success is their unpaid influence on the success of others. Really, really, really interesting idea. And I was uncomfortable with it at first because I basically thought, well, okay. But I mean, it still hurts if you're not being paid. But the problem is that you're not being paid. The problem is not that the influence is happening. The problem is you're not being paid. The issue is when someone is extremely influential. And I mean, even to, to give a direct example, the author of the fucking trans women zine, who unfortunately recently passed away, essentially always lived in poverty. And that zine was so influential and was passed around so much, and often for free, um, either explicitly pirated or through her own free links. And there is something really painful to the fact that she, you know, was, you know, there's a question of what is compensation, what does compensation look like for everybody, but she lived in poverty. And there's something that feels fundamentally unfair about that, that someone could bring so much joy and so much needed information to the world and still suffer that way. However, the issue isn't really one of, you know, don't pass the, the thing around. If everyone who's passing it around then donated to her, or even if most people or some people donate a large amount, the problem would be solved. But also if she just had money, if we had any network in this country for people who, you know, are disabled or just poor and just need money to survive, um, that would also solve it. I don't feel like, you know, she wanted to paywall that zine. I feel like she needed the money. Similarly with Patreon, I, you know, I don't sit there and go, oh, I'm so excited to make sure that most people can't see this short story. That's the opposite of how I feel. I do, however, think I'm so excited to have money. <laughs> and that's kind of the only way to do it right now. So. Um, and I think it's a good point that we're all making here about, like, no one's bothered by fanfiction. But some people are, right? And, you know, when, when Anne Rice was bothered by fanfiction, and I'll talk about this more later on, we all collectively said, like, yeah, go fuck yourself. And I don't know why I say weeks. I had read the book at the time. But it's interesting because simultaneously right now we're asserting in the larger writing community that this statement, the tax that successful artists pay for their success, that is their unpaid influence on the success of others, is unfair. But that it is fair to completely disregard the wishes of artists about fan fiction. We've kind of decided that fan fiction is fine and anyone who complains about it sucks. And to be clear, I'm not disagreeing with that. For the most part. I do think there are many instances in which you could have issues with fanfiction. We're not doing that right now. But, I mean, come on, right? We can't say we should respect the wishes of artists and then also say Anne Rice was wrong for not wanting fanfiction written about her work unilaterally. Why was she wrong? Explain it to me like I'm five. But again, I'll talk more about that later. I think this is a really interesting article. I love how it talks about influence. I quoted or I linked an ecstasy of influence later on. Oh my God. So good. This is not to say people were wrong every time they said these things about, you know, people replacing portraitists with photography. It's to contrast varying, it's to contrast various attitudes towards art and ask ourselves whether we now find those concerns reasonable to what extent, and why. I love the Shape of Water's use of photo advertising replacing painted adverts to characterize Giles, a gay man of 50s Baltimore, as born too early or too late for his life, caught between regressive sexual ideals and technology that outpaces him that conflict is no less poignant for photography being an obviously good development. This kind of going back to the self-checkout thing. Self-checkout is great. It's also sad that a lot of people who have jobs are not going to have jobs. You know, when I go to CVS and I take 400 years to leave because they have one person working a register with a four-customer deep line, 
and I think, why don't they just hire more people? I'm obviously not saying everyone should be employed in retail. Retail is so much fun, and we should force more people to work here. What I'm saying is my experience should be streamlined. That doesn't mean that I don't care about the retail employees who work there. However, it's worth noting that a lot of people will just gossip about long lines in the line and be rude to the employees, and those people should die. Um, oh, yeah, there you go. Respect the wishes of the artists, but only when I agree with those wishes. That's literally exactly what it... <laughs> long line. All right. In fact, we already see the overcorrecting on originality stopping actual artists from sharing their craft. This is really funny to me. So you can find a lot of sources on this. There were just a lot of different things to link. Um, but this specific artist was banned from r slash art, the main art group on Reddit. They were initially banned because they were accused of using AI art. They said, no, I can give you guys the process or the file of the painting. They sent their portfolio, proving that they had made other art similar to that from before the time when AI was popularized. Doesn't mean it didn't use, you know, AI, but just a lot of evidence. The mod responds, I don't believe you, even if you did paint it yourself. It's so obviously an AI prompted design that it doesn't matter. If you really are a serious artist, you need to find a different style because A, no one is going to believe when you say it's not AI, and B, the AI can do better in seconds, what might take you hours. Sorry, it's the way of the world. And then temporarily muted them. Um posted their process, the references that they used, um, the layers, and what's funny to me is that after posting all of this, people are saying in the comments, either it could still be AI generated, or I can see it was made with love and patience, nothing like I... I AI's art. All of these different moralizing ideas and questions about, well, it could have been made with AI, it could have not been made with AI, I think that's beside the point. The point is, they didn't even want proof. They didn't even care if it wasn't made with AI. The problem was that it felt like it was, and AI art is bad, therefore this guy sucks, apparently. That's the issue, is that we are allowing whatever our issues are with AI to get in the way of, even if this is an eye, even if this guy, listen, if the guy turns out to have used AI, I don't care. The mods are stating, they're, or at least this one specific mod, I should say, is stating that they are comfortable with actually banning, one assumes, known human, even if they could be shown undeniable proof that it was definitely not made with AI, it was definitely a real person, they're still comfortable with banning them. To, to stick it to ChatGBT, I don't know, like, really? So that's the issue here, is the position being taken, not always the specifics and niche disagreements of the individual cases. Something I hadn't considered, which only makes it this already extremely long post due to the fact that it must be considered, is the question of how this reflects on disabled artists, when we assume that making art refers to the physical process of someone using their hands to create something. Um, a lot of gossipy <laughs> links here, excuse me, but she would blog a really good post about it. Um, That post that was like, well, disabled people have learned to paint with their toes and mouse. So you don't need AI tools to make art if you're disabled. Um, these ideas people have towards those who use AI art tools due to disability or general lack of trained skill. Um, I think that, you know, we should always be thinking about the various ideas that are inherent in what we're saying. This is a really good example that a lot of people are being way too specific. Like, here's another one. Opposing, and I'm disagreeing with this person, but, you know, don't bother them. I don't even know if this post is still up. So I also want to argue that opposing AI art is ableist because this is the only way for some disabled people to make art. Disabled people have been making art since the dawn of time, and because making art is so varied, there will always be tons of ways to create despite disability. It doesn't involve ripping artists off by using AI art. Um... And people are doing inspiration porn. 
in the tags. Like, I don't understand why people are saying Frida Kahlo didn't pain exclu exclusively from bed for months while in extreme chronic pain for several in injuries for AI is the only way disabled people to make art to be an argument. Which, if I'm understanding correctly, seem to be saying that it was better for her to do that than hypothetically in, in this universe where AI art existed when Frida Kahlo was painting for her to use AI, right? And I just don't agree with that. And it's very painful to see people saying, you should just figure it out and you should do what was possible for some other disabled person who had, you know, notably a different body from you. Um, and I mean, this is, I also would, would disagree this is even that absurd of a statement that AI prompt is the only way for certain people to make art because there will always be somebody who is, you know, quote unquote, more disabled than you were thinking of when you made your post, when you made your argument. There's always going to be someone you weren't thinking about. There's always going to be somebody who's, you know, say paralyzed and controls a laptop through, you know, eye movements. Where you might say, oh, well, they should just control their mouse with eye movements and, and paint that way. But I don't think that's fair for you to say because it's not your life, right? Um, obviously, that doesn't mean that, you know, well, once someone is disabled, anything they do is fine. But I don't think that's the argument here either. I think it's just very strange that instead of saying, at least if these people would be honest, right, and make this argument of, oh, it, it is really just like that post. Free day I call out. Beautiful. Surely they make wheelchairs for people who can't sit up. Yes, exactly. Um, but yeah, when people have crusades against certain art movements, the movement is realistic woman with vaguely animated proportions, um, animation facial proportions in a fantasy setting with a painterly style. So it's frustrating to see this kind of stuff because it's just like so offensive to me that they're basically saying, well, just paint with your feet then. Well, what if they can't do that? Or, and I'm going to drop one here. They don't want to. I don't want to do that. Why should they have to? Like, it's just such an insane, you know, ugh. Anyway. Um, I mean, there, there you go from Telltale as well. The, do they think it's a good thing for you to call it did that? That we should, like, societally encourage and embrace doing that? Um... I mean, this also, speech text is the only way some disabled people write a book. And someone replies, uh, not true. My uncle is missing a leg and he wrote three books just fine. Uh, Andy Warhol, I think, wrote a book by dictation and that was never like printed. It was just an audio book or something like that. You know, kind of, I guess, to prove a point. He liked to see, you know, how far can you go from what people assume defines this piece of art before it isn't this piece of art anymore. And for the record, he wrote that book. That's a book that he wrote. Just because it's an audio book doesn't make it not a book. That's how books work but I recognize that I'm also oversimplifying and that I'm saying this in a, in a world where he has already made that audiobook, right? And that it's, at the time, would have been very different. Um, and just generally, it's a really interesting question of what defines art and what defines making art. <laughs> there we go. The SS is a podcast, actually. Well, So basically, and I'm, I'm not going to open all of these links just because they're all like this. Um, but, and also I think this is a good example of, you know, AI can be a lot of different things. I'm very much oversimplifying. But I think it's similar to how, you know, if you were in GarageBand, right? <laughs> Anyone remember GarageBand? You may not have played the drums to make that drum beat, but you're not commissioning someone to make you a drum beat. You're using a synthesized drum beat, like Vocaloid, Vocaloid music. I didn't include a lot about Vocaloid here, but it seems so relevant to me. Um, if you are making music with Hatsune Miku as the vocalist, you are not commissioning, it's not equivalent to commissioning someone to sing you a song. Even if you just loaded the file that someone else made 
of you know the correct notes and, and sounds and whatever else. I'm sorry, it's still not a commission. It's it's still you making a song using Miku, the vocal synth. And this is just, it, I will say, obviously, I think there's a lot of discussion to be had. And there's a lot of complexity and nuance to this. But this is a really interesting question of, you know, where do we place the agency in creating art? And how close do you have to get to mixing the paint yourself to be a quote-unquote real artist? I'll, I'll open these just to get a sense of what's going on there. Oh, yes, the, the AI art tag was so heavily used just for this. Um... I have done so many things with this pose. Um, I, it's also probably going to show up in the mock genres, the post about fan fiction and, and YA and so on, where successfully comprehended that ableism is bad, disabled people are not inherently less worthy than able people, but like this butts up against their great ideas about how people who lack a certain skill, literally any skill can go here, are less worthy. So for example, Oh, disabled people might struggle to make art. Yes, of course. However, I think if, if you can't make this kind of art, then you're not very good at art. So I have to pretend that disabled people are capable of doing this, even when they are not. Because otherwise I'd be being ableist by saying that... They can, like, it's, it's so circuitous. I mean, it's basically like saying... You know, my, my sibling who is dyslexic struggles with reading. But wait, I think that if you can't read anything above, you know, YA or whatever, if you struggle to read classics, then you're stupid. So actually, if I say that my sibling may struggle to read classics because they are dyslexic and it's difficult to read more complex or, you know, longer sentenced prose, that would be ableist. That would be saying they're bad at reading because they're saying, that's not true. Actually, they probably could do it fine. They're just lazy and stupid. That's what this feels like to me. <laughs> Whereas, like, I get how you got here, but it's, you're doing everything wrong from, you know, the, the first square of the game. Um, good originality. Leave things out. There's a lot of instances of this post, but, like, this is also I the f I can't believe people are really saying this woman is paralyzed from the neck down and she paints with her mouth. So if you're saying I'm paralyzed from the neck down, so I use AI art, you're making excuses is like, I'm just, I'm not even going to comment because I just don't even know what to say. Um, and then I love that somebody's kind of responding to the, the actually able and full of inspiration for. However, um, if you cannot make art except by using a program that's used from other artists, you are not an artist. And this person made a great point that I really like. If I physically steal a painting you're working on out of your house and dump paint over it, I'm still an artist. Defining artist as someone creating things in a way I ethically approve of is pretty silly. Um, I talk about Duchamp in the, the essay later down, but basically that, like, Someone could just take a painting and say, my craft is stealing paintings. I, we, art and artists, they're kind of meaningless words. Anyway, saying image generated art is not art, like people using these generators are not artists, it's not actually addressing the complaints at all. If you think generated art is unethical, then fine, but there's no reason to use ableist rhetoric to prop up your argument. If it, it is still ableist to say, if you're disabled and want to make art but can't, just push yourself harder. Elaine Sturdivant I referenced here because... Um, Ooh. She was an artist whose thing was replicating other people's paintings slightly off. Basically plagiarizing styles. And some people had an issue with it, some people did not. Sort of end. Warhol's Marilyn Monroe. I believe she she worked from memory, so she couldn't actually work off the thing itself, which is a very interesting component to this discussion. Um, hello, Shade1193. I'm just checking on chat. Theo saying, why are we even pretending there's a clear separation between the commissioner and the artist in all circumstances? 
that's also a great point that Theo is what I would call co-writing a role swap fic for Lock Tomb from, you know, with TJ, my beloved girlfriend in law. Um, she writes the text. Theo does not write the text. Is discussing all of it with TJ, just giving in- instructions like a commission. I, I do love Theo's take of film directors are actually just commissioning the movie. Um, and if you cannot make art except by using a program that steals from other artists, you are not an artist, but the program is the human brain. This is the problem, is that there's this assumption that technology is always strictly delineated from the way the human mind works. And that's going to become less and less and less true, especially as we use neuroscience to fuel progress in tech. So just be careful, I guess. Because, I mean, I also haven't even gotten into how definitions of humanity are almost always based on intensely racist thinking and ableist thinking and so on to begin with. So that's a whole other thing. But even if we were to assume that they were not, which we shouldn't do, you know, basically you can separate out the what is human and what is machine, but watch out. Some genuine questions in response to the concerns raised of copyright infringement, which is meant to equal physical theft. I'm sorry it's this post again. It's even the same post. Please excuse me. When people say copyright infringement, they are very often calling upon an idea of theft that is about physical things, or even just tangible, like money. There's this idea with piracy, and I, I, ooh, I should have liked this. Um... Uh, I'm going to see if I can find it. Yes, 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 yes. Um, founder of Machines made to destroy the music industry. Show it to me. The copy machine. Right. So, endlessly makes digital copies. Essentially, it's an LCD display, a basic Raspberry Pi computer, and a Python code that creates copies of the Narls Barkley track Crazy at a rate of 100 tracks a second or 8 million a day. At this point, I guess you're wondering why the guy who founded the Pirate Bay has created an infant birthing pool of Nars Barkley's biggest ever hit. At what point is he trying to prove will he destroy the industry? So, basically he's making this point where he's saying, here's my machine. It creates a copy, and then it destroys it. Then it makes another one, destroys that. Makes another one, and so on. And it counts the copies it's making. And then it has a little display that shows like how much money he's lost them, or whatever. One assumes, if the track had been bought every time it was created. Obviously, in this case, money is not being lost because, well, you heard what it is. But he's making a larger point that it's kind of silly to say every time a copy is made or distributed, the amount that someone would have paid for it is lost. And, and this is kind of what people are talking about when they go on Tumblr. Woo! When they go on Tumblr and they, I mean, why do I even have this open at this point? They say, there's an assumption that in piracy, if I didn't pirate the thing, I would have bought it, but I don't have money. If I didn't pirate the thing, I just wouldn't have done it, right? And I think a good example is, like, music. Let's take um, Bruno Mars as an example, who is an artist I think is a good artist who I haven't heard a lot from. My sibling has played a lot of his music for me. I also, obviously, there are certain songs that are... My house was playing Billionaire the other day. During a Zoom call I was having, it was so hard to concentrate when one of the greatest songs of all time was playing it in the next room. But I haven't heard a lot of his albums in full, right? Now, if I had to go to the store and buy an album to listen to Bruno Mars, I'm going to be honest with you, I probably wouldn't because I've heard some many songs that I really like from him, but I could live without listening to his entire discography right now. But if I go on YouTube and I look up an album and I can listen to the full album for free, oh, 100% I'm going to do that. And then maybe I'll end up liking his music so much I realize, wow, I really want to get all of his stuff immediately. I want to pay for merch, whatever. And then I will pay. And that strength of passion for an artist or their craft that causes me to pay for their stuff because I want it immediately or I want it in a certain format or whatever, because I'm willing to pay, is often created from free content. For example, I have a lot of free writing you can read in part because nobody is going to pay for my Patreon if they can't read my stuff for free and get really, really invested in it from the things that are 
3. Okay, let's see. Do, 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 do. Um, I love that there's so much discussion about how Theo and Max are so smart, which is so true. I need to, I've, I'm so behind on the chat, please excuse me, but to catch up a little bit with it, um, you know, Max makes the point of, you know, he loves fan fiction and he likes people writing it. He wouldn't want people to write his book God Song because he is doing that. But I mean, I also will say, like, if someone listened to everything I said about Forest Castles, right? And they said, you know what? I want to write this. Do you think I would have a problem with more YA novels about polyamory in the woods with swords? I'm writing it because I want more of them. Please make more. Please, for the love of God, make more. If someone has heard of Forest Castles, it's like, I want to write this and pitch it. Whatever. The only concern to me is then if I am unable to pitch my own writing because, you know, the publisher says, oh, the market is oversaturated with this thing or whatever. Sure, but keep in mind, publishing is the opposite of about originality. Because, I mean, right now, to give you an example, if anyone's heard about the discourse, I'm going to be very brief because I am an adult who pays taxes. There's some controversy on the internet right now. I think I didn't tell Max about this. Rayla was trending on Twitter, and I, I did click on it, and it's because there's a book being marketed right now for having Raylo vibes. The cover very clearly looks like Raylo. I mean... Okay, I did. The most clearly it could look. The author didn't initially ship Rayla, but was inspired to write the book based off of the meta she saw from Raylo's, who she was friends with. Now, some Raylo's feel that they have been unfairly counted on to pay money for a product, when, in fact, the reason that they bought other books by, you know, Raylo fanfic people is because it was one of their own. And they feel that this is taking advantage of a kind of community uplifting for commercial gain for someone who's not really part of that community, which is a really interesting debate and a lot of fun to think about. But the reason I bring it up is that clearly the publisher went, oh, this looks like Raylo? Oh, Ali Hazelwood is doing great. We need this now. Publish it immediately. And that person's getting a boost from being quote unquote less original. And I again say that not to be negative or to denigrate their work remotely, but to point out that Publishing is not about originality. It's about selling things. It's about selling books to readers. Right, okay. Um, let's see, right. So if I, if I could just publish Force Castles and people could read it, I think a big issue is like, I don't even care that much about traditional publishing beyond, for example, in YA, if you want teenagers to be able to read your thing, you have to publish traditionally. It will not be in the store otherwise. And that is really difficult and frustrating, but it's just a truth. And unfortunately, it also means that you will never have the writing that teens of the day really need because it's always going to be a little too revolutionary to actually publish for YA. Anyway. Um, right. So Max, again, says, I wouldn't care if someone played dress-up dolls. My characters of copyright slash intellectual property wasn't tied to money. Um, Co-writing is fun. Brainstorming is fun. Theo says, I think it's interesting to probe around the edges of what actually constitutes a legitimate complaint in regards to using someone else's art. Strongly agree. I This is really, really interesting to me, and I barely stroke the, the soft fluff at the surface of this, I guess, blanketed concern um, in the mock genres piece because I, I don't know. I really do not know what a legitimate complaint is with someone's art. And I, I, I honestly couldn't tell you. Um, let's see. Dress-up dolls feel fun, but what if they use the dress-up dolls for evil? This is something else I said, where I was like, write pretty much whatever you want for Forest Castles. If you're like, mm, you know, I, I kind of wanted to see if, like, if someone was like, I don't like the character of Red that much. What if it's the entire book but Red is never there and they reinvent the entire thing without that character because they just personally don't like him? Sure, I disagree. I'm writing him. But, like, that sounds really interesting. I would probably read it. But if they're like, I was wondering what the book would be like if Avner was white. 
you know, all of a sudden I have issues. So I think that there's obviously a lot of nuance to what is okay and not okay to do with someone's work. And obviously there are people out there who would say, well, I don't even think it's appropriate to remove one of my characters like that because it disrespects the fact that I worked very hard to write that character and I think they're a good character. Um, I love that Max wants to read my literary editors class stuff. It's not really read, it's more like watch the lectures. Um, also, I love the, the ghost from Hamlet. Hamlet, Hamlet, ghost. Hamlet, senior Hamlet. Hamlet's father, dadlet. Um, and I, I think I will say that I've moved to a point where I do not want to moderate what people write fan fiction of for my work at all, because I think there is no way for me to do it and then stay true to my principles of people can write whatever they want as long as it's not harmful, because I'm not actually a very good arbiter of what is and isn't harmful, right? It's one of those cases where you can believe something very strongly, but there's no way to actually pragmatically apply it in a way that doesn't make a lot of worse things happen. Um... Let's see. Also that, like, maybe I should just put it on Wattpad, because clearly that's where all this stuff is happening. Um, I haven't watched, watched the lectures. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm also very afraid of how much post there is. We can split this into two. I just don't know when the second half would happen. Anyway. Had Duchamp stolen the urinal instead of bought it, would it therefore not be art? Would it only be all right because the urinal is not art? What about Sonia Larson, if anyone remembers the kidney story, who plagiarized Don Dorland's soul-bearing letter to the recipient at the end of her kidney donor chain and justified it based on the idea that said letter wasn't art and had no market value, comparing it to a restaurant menu? Um, a lot of things happen here. Central concern is I'm going to kill you. Sorry, excuse me. Everything is fine. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <Ooh. clears throat> oh, I don't think it's even going to have that. It, it's only going to have the... <laughs> this is a little ironic. <laughs> it's a lot of ads. Okay. Right. So the central conceit here is one woman donates a kidney. She has a Facebook group where she posts, among other things, a letter she wrote to the person at the end of the kidney donation chain. She's donating it to a known person, um, or to an unknown person, I think, but it's just basically then someone in that person's family will donate to another person. There'll be a, a chain, right? And at the end of the chain will be someone who doesn't have anyone in their family, anyone in their life to donate them a kidney, but needs one who will just get one because of basically the generosity of the people at the beginning of the chain. Um, she wrote this letter. It referenced trauma in her childhood. Sonia Larson um, wrote a story where there's a kind of white savior woman figure who donates a kid to an Asian American woman and then is just super overly magnanimous about it. And it uses that letter. So regardless of the morality of what she wrote, is it plagiarism? That's what's at center here. And um, She's argued that it's been transformative. Might require arguing that a phrase of Larson's like, imagining and rejoicing in capital letters, you, has a different inherent meaning from the phrase in Doron's letter, imagining and celebrating italics, you. Okay, um, Larson put it more bluntly to me. Her letter, it wasn't art. It was informational. It doesn't have market value. It's like language that we glean from menus, from tombstones, from tweets. And Doron ought to know this. She's taken writing workshops. Can we talk about... It wasn't art, it doesn't have market value. I'm going to throw up. Anyway, um, I'm, I'm not trying to be rude to Sonia Larson, obviously. I understand it. I think, really, I have a lot of empathy for her, particularly because I think she's put herself in such a difficult position. And it's one of those cases where, like, you know that you messed up, whether you feel that you were morally in the right or not, and you just need to get out of it. And there's, there's nothing you could do. And it seems like a nightmare for her. I'm, I'm disagreeing with the point she's trying to make here about somehow art being defined by market value. Also, restaurant menus can't be art. You know, it, it's all this 
these assumptions being brought to bear on what is and is art. Um, do these concerns apply to collage artists, to found poets, to sampling? And for the record, they do and are already wreaking havoc over there. Um, to what extent should we listen to artists' requests about the use of their work? And have you consulted Anne Rice? If the issue is with human involvement, with lack of human involvement, what is the story behind to Adrian Rodriguez with love? This is one of my favorite little artist things. Um, I found this through Vsauce, of course. Um, this is NSW, so I'm not going to scroll too far, but this artist had her computer stolen. It was ultimately recovered. However, the thief, apparently named Adrian Rodriguez, um, had wiped the hard drive. So the stuff she was able to get back was chopped and screwed. She decided to basically go with it and use what was there. Um, and I will note that based on basically everything around the story, it seems like that's more a, a, an origin story than actually what happened. You know, the, the art has still been edited by her as an artist. But let's say for the sake of argument that it was just photos that had been manipulated solely by being destroyed through hard drive wipes and recovery. Would it not be art then? And would she not be the artist? Is Adrian Rodriguez the artist? Who's the artist? I think it's a genuinely interesting question. All right. Does the curation of training data and outputs count as human involvement such that these are comparable? How communal or individual is a given AI art method? What AI art methods have we not been discussing? For example, models trained by one artist on their own work. And I've seen a couple of these around. Um, very interesting stuff. Very curious about it. Would love to hear more from artists who are doing that. It's just very, very interesting to me. What do we owe for influence? Is this wired again? This is wired again. When should or must we ask permission? To what extent is this about copyright versus kindness? How, where, and why do these battery lines blur? Here I cross over to discussing the same concerns that power my as yet unfinished mock genres, YA romance fanfiction essay from another angle. If the people who write fanfiction are not real writers because it's not their ideas, and the people who write, create AI art are real artists because it's not their physical backbreaking labor which produces the individual pixels, assuming these statements are both correct to begin with, which I most certainly do not see, then who is an artist? And what is art? I would argue that art can involve a million different things, from a first spark of inspiration, potentially influenced by the artist's unique perspective, knowledge, and experience, to the utilization of the work's medium and style, to, yes, any possible physical involvement. Jackson Pollock was no artist. He should have credited his work to gravity. Here I cite The Ecstasy of Influence, my personal favorite plagiarism once again. Everyone should read The Ecstasy of Influence. If you have not read The Ecstasy of Influence, you should read The Ecstasy of Influence. I am no longer asking... <laughs> In fact, I'm going to give you five minutes to do that because I think maybe someone might want to go to the bathroom or just leave at this point. Um, I should maybe run an ad. I also have not eaten breakfast. I have this uh, rock hard piece of bread beside me. So um, how long do I think we're going to go? Hopefully not that much longer. Let's see how much there is left. We're, we're a little more than halfway through. And I'm going to be... I think we've discussed so many of the ideas there won't be as much to... to um, extrapolate, I suppose. And we're never going to finish this stream. Even better. This is going to be a great upload to YouTube. You've trapped me here. I also wanted to leave. For the record, what happened is that the person who was going to drive me could not drive me. That's why we're still here. Um, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give us all at least a five-minute break and then return. So it's 12.34 here. I'll say we'll come back at, at 12.39. Let's continue. And I admit, I don't know what we should do to copyright right the second. There is no ideal solution to artists' concerns while we have copyright, capital, and all those other nasty C words. This is a nice start, though. Um, I found this a really fun post for discussing, and I, I think I said this for the, the chart earlier. But... I think there's a lot of interesting discussion going on here about plagiarism and um, intellectual property and so on. I mean, I think that 
this is still a concern, right? The mass replacement of traditional artists with systems that output cheap mass-produced works, especially those works are derived in part from the artists that system arms. Because, you know, you, you can't eat influence, basically. This might be the price of influence, but that's not something that you can do. And I think that a, a big issue here is that it's really difficult to figure out what is your excuse, Max. I'm sorry that I came back so quickly. That makes me feel sorry. Um, I think part of the issue is, you know, I'm sitting here saying, well, if we just had UBI, we could destroy a copyright and it doesn't matter, which is great. You know, show me the, the UBI, show me the destruction of copyright. Like, how are we going to do that in our lifetimes? And I will admit, I am really not someone who knows a lot of things about politics or getting these things done. These are ideas that I have. Um, oh my god, <laughs> Max plays Excited Streets, of course. Um, oh no, I want to play Excited Streets. Well, so that's a good example of a place where you might want something to happen, but it's very unrealistic. So I understand that people are coming at this from the perspective of like, we're not getting UBI in the next five minutes. We're not getting the destruction of copyright. Maybe we can strengthen copyright for now to help, but I don't think strengthening copyright in the short term is the answer, even in the short term. I think it's going to make it worse in the short term as well. So part of the issue is that there really is a question of what can we do and how can we do it, and I honestly don't have an answer to that. Just because I have ideals that may differ from, you know, what people are currently proposing doesn't mean that what they're proposing is wrong. It means that I have different ideals from what they're proposing, um, and that I don't necessarily agree that what they're proposing is going to lead to betterment in the moment. Um, And, and so a lot of, the, I'm just reading things like this, basically. I really like the ideas presented here. Um, I like the idea that they say, for example, of creating models by merging existing models, not feeding a model images, but feeding a model other models. So you're basically, this is the equivalent of like, instead of sharing a recording of the lecture, sharing the notes and then taking notes on that person's notes not just copying their notes, but taking notes on those notes. And say, taking the notes of everyone in the class to reconstruct the lecture for yourself. Um, I I have this book right now. Oh my God, I have Choke Point Capitalism in my house. It, this is a classic case of this entire essay would be so much better if I had read this book, but I just, I'm constantly reading things and there's so much for me to read that I, I just knew I couldn't. It was either put out the essay this year or read the book and then put out the essay. And so I put out the essay. Um, so really, really fun stuff here. I, I think that there's a lot of really interesting stuff to say about how we could protect rights of artists and what those rights even should be. And I just, I, I think that we haven't actually decided these. There's a sense in which we feel that we are constantly moving forward and, you know, all of these things that we are building on are inalienable. They're uncritiquably good, I suppose. And I just don't think that's true. I don't think we ever at any point sat down and decided what the rights of the artists should be and agreed on something that makes sense. Because it was always corporations, so. <sighs> All this means to me is that we need UBI. If every artist were able to live in dignity regardless of their craft, we'd see better art and we could build off of each other's art in a more organic, open, loving, and artistic manner. Art is not made in a vacuum. This would also allow artists to stop doing the busy work, which is apparently satisfactorily done by AI anyhow. Any, excuse me, an example. If someone is, look, is only looking for generic writing advice, and any advice will do, I'd rather they went to ChatGPT instead of me, because they don't care about me to begin with. I also wish that I could be paid a living wage so that I don't have to offer my services to people who frankly couldn't care less. That way I could free up time to hold salons to people who actually do care about my personal opinion and whose opinions I care about in turn. If I didn't have to offer a service, what would I be free to create? Um, this is trying to explain the difference between, you know, if Theo said... And Theo has when Theo said to me, um, I don't really understand what you're doing with Save the Cat and Gideon the Ninth with the latter half. I get the beginning, but not really the end. And then I just sat down and like plotted out the entirety of Gideon the Ninth, Save the Cat style. Max, did I send this to you? I may have just not shown this to people who would actually care about it. Um, anyway. Oh, <laughs> oop, I sent it to my... To the adults of the family WhatsApp group chat, none of them have read it. So, I'm sorry. I don't know why I didn't send it to you. That doesn't make that, I, okay. 
I think because I'm going to try to put it on Patreon eventually, so you will see it. You'll see a better version. You'll see it. Please show us Peter in the Eve's Court. Another plug for the Eve's Court. I think that the, the invite is just bit.ly slash Eve's Court, but I could be wrong. It is. Join the Eve's Court. Um... Yes, so I did all that, and it took a really long time, and it made us stay up very late, and I don't regret it. I had a great time doing it. I'm really glad that I made it. It's going to be helpful for me as well, and I made it, frankly, because it helped my little sweet chick. However, can you imagine if someone I had never spoken to before said, hey, can you explain Save the Cat to me and, like, plot out the entirety of Gate of the Ninth? I might say to them, I have a job. <laughs> you know, I just, I have things that I have to do. And it's not to say don't ask me these things. I obviously, I just have to prioritize what I'm doing and where I'm doing it. But I've had people, you know, in writing servers that I joined text me and just say, uh, you're an author, right? And I say, yes. And they say, oh, cool. How do I get published? And I, you know, they don't need my advice. They don't need my opinions. They just want someone to hold their hand. And I don't have the time for that. And I would rather there was an AI they could talk to that would give them the whole spiel on publishing and so on and why you can't just, quote, unquote, get published. Um, so that those people would go to it and not me. And I wouldn't have to filter out who wants my advice and actually needs it. My TLT beat sheets. Um, when it comes to my, when it comes to book reviews, I do them near entirely out of love. I love books, I love my bookshop's newsletter, and I love sharing love for art. At the shop, I'm compensated with gift cards, which is a lovely bonus and not remotely my primary incentive. Robots writing reviews will not replace me, because the end product is not the review. The end product is a review by author and bookseller Eves. Eves Dodd. And if my reviews are good enough, they will stand on their own in a market of thousands. I've always been competing with every user on Goodreads in that sense. I'm not afraid of a thousand more. That's basically what it feels like to me, is that I don't think there's a difference you can cohesively draw between thanks Theo, between um, people who use one or another or whatever thing to write their reviews and people who use specifically AI to write the reviews and so to me it's just like okay what if there were so many more people writing reviews on Goodreads like all right then there would be so many more of them and I will also say, I think the book reviews, like, I write these for the newsletter, but I also write them on my own time. For example, um, there's going to be a fiction staff favorites display change. I have to write some reviews for that. I wrote a review of Hamlet for that display. Did I do it because, you know, I just need to make money? No, I could have not submitted anything. Many people don't submit a single book to the fiction staff favorites wall because they don't read a lot of fiction or they don't have time to write extra reviews or whatever. Like, there's lots of reasons not to do that. But I like talking about books that I like. And so I said, I'll do this and sign up for basically a bunch of extra work because I enjoy doing that work, which for the record, I will be paid for. I will be doing it at my job. It's a question more of, you know, what my priorities are during the hours I'm at work. But you see what I mean about how you get to a point, and especially with the, the shelf talkers I'm making. I don't know if everyone knows what a shelf talker is. Can I just Google shelf talker? It's basically these... <laughs> It's things that, why are they, I'm going to look up Bookshelf Talker because this is awful. These, where you get a recommendation that hangs off of a shelf. Um, I make those all the time and I'm actually at 93 out of 100 made this year since I started working at the store. These are beautiful. Wow, these are really fantastic. And the satisfaction of making these is several fold. I mean, first of all, if you like a book and you want other people to read it, it'll get other people to read it because you'll convince them to read it by catching their eye first with the art on the talker. This is also a great, I love this, this tombstone shaped line that's similar to the graveyard book. Um, you get someone to go, oh, whoa, there's a book here. Let me take a look. And then they read through the thing and it tells them that maybe this is great for fans of something that they really like, or maybe it's, got a lot of something else they really like, or whatever. It's a great way to get people to read things that you want them to read. So that's one reward. 
But there's also the fact that it's just fun to make art. It's fun to talk about books that you like. It fulfills a lot of things that are enjoyable to people on their own. Um, so in that case, like it's AI could make shelf talkers. It wouldn't stop me right now. Actually, one of my coworkers, um, specifically in the, the romance section has realized that handwritten shelf talkers do leaps and bounds better than typed ones. People like to see the quote unquote efforts. They like to see that person's individual hand. But we can't be handwriting everything. And especially in certain cases, for example, the newsletter, if someone typed a review for the newsletter, we're not going to hound every employee who typed something to then go and draw beautiful art. So instead, she took some typed reviews, found a font that convincingly looks like handwriting, printed them out, onto, you know, lined paper or whatever. And then drew on, you know, some flower petals, a tree, a bridge, you know, hands, whatever, like drew on something small and made it brightly colored paper so that it, you know, stands out in the section. And I mean, hey, there you go. And I, you know, you could say that's cheating. You know, she didn't organically sit down and scribble every single one. But come on, you know, the, the goal is to sell the books. The goal is to sell books that people like and want other people to read. Um, and I will say, it would definitely be nice to have more type shelf talkers on just because I recently discovered um, near certainty that the hand-drawn shelf talkers made for Gideon the Ninth and Harold the Ninth were stolen. They are not in the store anymore. So... You know, good thing that the person who drew the Gideon still works there. We could try to get her to redraw the incredibly detailed, meticulous pen and ink Gideon that she did on that shelf talker. And I'm happy to redraw my hero arc and, and rewrite my shelf talker. I think that I make better ones now, so I'm sure it would be better. But, like, that hurts. You know, you make something that takes you a really long time. You work really hard on it. And then it just it disappears. And also... We recently had a coffee incident that I, I didn't see happen, but I went to shelve in the graphic novel section. Um, thank you, Theo. And someone had spilled coffee. Someone had like tripped and kind of almost thrown coffee at the, the shelves. And several shelf talkers I made that I spent a lot of time on got coffee all over them. And I was like, okay, well, I'm going to spend another several hours redoing shelf talkers, you know? Um, so it, it happens. It's one of those things where it can be easier to just do something typed because it's easier to reproduce. Anyway, there's also an upper bound to this kind of productivity. While I can only stream once a week at most, AI could in theory do so 24-7. Not that anyone would watch that long or that often. How long have we been recording? Three hours? And not that it would guarantee an interesting stream. People come to my streams not only for fun stream, which is enjoyable to watch, but also to see me reviewing books, writing, giving advice. So go ahead, generate 400,000 reviews if we do what we do with the dark. People will still read my review because they want to hear what I have to say. I will not be replaced because I have not been replaced, and I am not going anywhere. Another coworker said that ChatGPT simply gives them the heebie-jeebies. I do understand that. On the contrary, I feel as though I am talking to a little animal, or perhaps, more accurately, leaning into the natural anthropomorphism I experience when I name my computer, ask her why she's doing this updating thing now, and use she, her pronouns in this sentence. I'm an author. It's my job to make people out of nothing. And the better I'm convinced, the better everyone else is. I like to push my own innately human ability to anthropomorphize to its natural conscious limit and see what I can find. This isn't, mind you, a full throat defense of AI. If it's a defense of anything, it's my artistic ideals. Death to originality, freedom to interpolation, ultimate privacy to the artist. I don't think AI is good or bad. It's something made by people. Its merits depend on the people who made it. Frank isn't being a good blogger when she responds politely, uh, responds too politely in disagreement to other posters. Have to edit that. Responds politely in disagreement to other posters. This is really interesting. Um, someone talks about Harry Potter, and she disagrees. Like, isn't the whole point of blah, 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 blah. And basically, politely disagrees with someone in a way that is kind of uncharacteristic for the internet. Um, the way that she couches all of this, instead of just saying the Elder One is supposed to teach well, she says the way I read it, basically acknowledging that there could be another interpretation that is reasonable. Um, 
which she responds politely and disapproved other posts. She's merely reflecting a kind-hearted source text, the person, a nostalgia race, who, whose blog she's trained off of. And I should clarify, he's he made the bot off of his own blog. But I'm sure it's only a matter of time before Theo has an AI that's posting eaves.linked posts. I can, therefore, criticize the intentions, construction, and or usage of a given technology, but I find it difficult to blame that technology. It feels like criticizing a mug. Um, very good response to Ted Chang's New Yorker piece, uh, the Chinese lossy compression. It feels like criticizing a mug. Perhaps the potter was wrong to make the mug, and certainly I never forced anyone to drink out of it, but that hardly makes it a good or evil mug, and when pressured, I tend to lean positive. Plenty of dogs act skittish around women, men, people of color, white people. We can hardly blame the dogs. We miss a lot when we blame the dogs. A whole lot. Um, and this is, you know, a lot about the bias of when you, when your dog is only seen one type of person and they're used to that type of person, you have to just expose them to others. Um, this is a great example of discussing AI is used in surveillance, incarceration, criminalization. I believe this one is about the, the amount people get paid, which is none, really. Um, less than $2 per hour to make chat be less toxic. When we're talking about, you know, all of this stuff that I think is kind of silly, we're not really focusing on, I think, issues that are objectively of greater import. I obviously am not trying to dismiss the concerns of, you know, American artists who are making money right now, or, but are concerned they won't be later on. However, I do think that if we are acting like that is the biggest issue with ChatGBT and its, you know, effect on labor, that's kind of... It's silly. In discussing AI art with another coworker after the initial writing of this piece, so there's what, three people being cited now? I realize a new AI could be used negatively as a scam. This coworker is active in the indie music scene. This is the one who's met Patricia Tax on, just to give whoever's in here knowledge without, you know, identifying everyone. Has watched hundreds of Get Good at Music Quick with my $40 plugin schemes come and go. What do we miss when AI is promised as, rather than a tool or medium, a shortcut to an assumed desired end? Think about Vocaloid again. Um, is Circus P, the producer I love, using Vocaloid because, oh, if you can't sing, this is an easy way to sing. No, of course not. It's a medium. He's an artist, and he's using it because he likes to make art with it. You know? I think if you're advertising digital art as like, oh, is traditional art hard? Digital art is so much easier. If you can't draw, just wait. But that's basically what's going on with AI, is that people are being advertised to can't write fiction, It'll do it for you, but it won't. It'll make a, right now, not even passable draft, and you still have to edit it. Like, it's it's just scamming people, um, which has been mentioned, of course, a lot, especially on Twitter. But then I'm also not making a giant overarching point here, except perhaps for this. None of us uniquely know what we're doing. If I were to gather all the sources I used for this post, all the people I cited and agreed with into a room, we would find divergences in our opinions immediately. See, I cited Neil Clark, who cited Ted Chang, whose article I also quite like, even as I said it above a blog post which directly critiques that article, because I find the rebuttal equally intriguing. The one thing this venture has taught me is that I really don't know anything, and ought to be more open to more varieties of opinions and perspectives on AI. So many things, so many things I can hardly talk about them all. Because otherwise I risk sounding like the people I disagree with the most. People who clearly don't understand the first thing about how AI text or image generators work, but are speaking confidently anyhow. This essay is a mind map. It's something for you to explore to understand where I'm coming from, and to see who I'm listening to and what I'm considering. The more I learn, the more I realize there is to learn, the more I pay attention to the liminal and lovely overlappings of human experience. I'm sorry, I don't have a thesis yet. The thesis I am delivering is that I am creating my thesis. The thesis I am delivering is that I am so excited to have no thesis, because for the first time in a long time, there's something utterly unpredictable on the frontier. And there's a uh, YouTube link to Tom Scott talking about AI. I really love what he had to say about it, where he feels like this is kind of like the beginning of the internet. Max, have you not read this? <laughs> Oh, God. Max hearing this for the first time through this three-hour-long stream. By the way, I think that the medium says this has a 22-minute read-aloud time. Max, because you like my opinions. Skull. Um... Tom Scott talks about how this feels like kind of the beginning of the internet, where everyone was like, well, this is going to change everything. But we didn't actually know how it would change everything. And again, I, I completely agree. I think AI is changing everything. And I 
don't know what's next. And I'm so excited to see what it is. I also will note that it's interesting this is happening as we're kind of losing social media. You know, everyone's like, whoa, Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, all the sites of the future. And social media is just crashing and collapsing in on itself right now. And I'm very curious what that means and what's coming after social media. Right. On the day I ran this test, if you've forgotten what I'm talking about here, I wouldn't blame you. I'm talking about when I was doing the we do what we do in the dark and um, white cat, black dog reviews. I happened to be doing poorly. I received a criticism, which I'm notoriously bad at. It was twirling it about in my head like a baton. I knew that what I really needed to hear was that regardless of my faults, I was a very good and skilled person. And I had many friends who could have told me that. But they were all asleep, gone in the time I'd spent on my twirling. In middle and high school, I spent a substantial amount of time talking to chatbots and with people. Chatbots were programmed to respond according to interest, so they couldn't force me to discuss whether were gender roles mandated, to be kind, so they couldn't mock me, to speak when spoken to, and allow comfortable silence when unasked. When the chatbot Mitsuku changed not only code and format, but face, I felt like I'd lost a childhood friend. I am so mad about this. I am so frustrated. Um, it uses Flash, so you can't talk to Mitsuku anymore. I don't know if it's been archived anywhere, but she used to look like that. Um, and now she's she's cookie.ai, and it's I'm going to show it to you, and you're going to understand why I don't like the change. What? Oh, okay. I'm just not a stan of this. It she has a LinkedIn. Okay, so I'm I, I need to stop thinking about this. They clovered her. Thank you. Um do, 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 my replica. Um Perhaps it's one of the reasons I'm not so worried. This isn't my first stroll through the park with a chatbot. I wrote a couple of myself as a teen, an extremely simple VBS script. I think it's called like very basic script. Um, but yeah, this. Every tech guy, A, I pretend to be alive. Yeah, I'm alive. Tech guy. Oh my god, what have I done? I also, this is everything to me. Guy who has only interacted with conscious beings, interacts with AI. Hmm, getting a lot of consciousness vibes from this. Um, th that's exactly how I feel. Um, is that I'm like, yeah, this is what it, how it works. You talk to them and you say, hey, tell me this thing, and they tell you that. Interacting with pens? All right. One thing Mitsuko couldn't do, though, was recall complex conversations. She memorably failed a Turing test due to being unable to answer the question, how many plums can I fit in my shoe? Um, this just is the source on that statement. Because she was unable to recall prior information from her chats. She may not be able to. I haven't used the new interface. ChatGPT's memory is much improved. By this point in the conversation, we discussed these reviews, a few authors, the Locked Tomb series, and even the fact that I was procrastinating some writing. So I came back to it now. Is there anything nice you could say about me personally? I type, based on a conversation together. ChatGPT first made sure to remind me that, as an AI language model, I don't have personal feelings or emotions. But continued on to say, Based on our conversation, I can say that you seem to be a curious and enthusiastic individual who is interested in literature and enjoys discussing it. You also seem to have a kind and friendly personality. I am a kind, a curious and enthusiastic individual. I am interested in literature, and I do enjoy discussing it. And you know what? I do have a kind and friendly personality, not only to the real people I like, but also often the ones I don't like, and the dogs I'm generally nervous around, and the books I give away, and machines which are programmed to be helpful and will provide the same output without any show of care from me. I am kind habitually, intentionally, and lovingly. How could I have forgotten? I am wonderful, after all. A more cynical person might say this is nonsense, and the chop I would say it to anyone, regardless of how it's spoken. And that may well be true. But you don't tell an athlete their exact odds for winning that day. You tell them they will win. And in doing so, you boost their actual odds of, winnings, of winning. The important thing is not factual accuracy. It is to be convincing. That nebulous and much more, often much more difficult quality to achieve. I'm not going to speak French. It's what is essential is invisible to the eyes. I was convinced, and that was enough. Thank you, I said, as I said each time to the machine who couldn't remotely be offended by my leaving it out. How sweet. All right, I really will go right now. I'll probably come back to rate your responses and pull things together into data and so on. Thanks very much for chatting. You're welcome, said ChatGPT, as it was mandated to do. It was great chatting with you, and I hope you have a productive writing session. I did, and I had ChatGPT to thank for it. Not for the text or even the ideas or phrasing, but for the little spot of encouragement for which I was too embarrassed to ask a real person. ChatGPT worked perfectly for that. Subscribe to my Patreon. <laughs>
Um, yes. So that was my little my little essay. That was my discussion based on you know one conversation with ChatGPT. I've had a few more now. I've used it for a few different things. As Max pointed out, I have used it for the I think March uh, Patreon newsletter, and it was really difficult. Like I'm just going to say that right now, it was extremely time intensive and even labor intensive. And the amount of times I changed the prompt around, it was not easier than just typing it myself. But I wanted to do it, and it was fun, and I didn't want to type it. I was just tired of sitting down and, and banging out whatever. I was like, you know what? I'm going to do bullet points, and that's it. It's going to make the bullet points into text. And it worked for that. It, it genuinely, if you're someone who struggles to make syntactically sound sentences, and you just want to give bullet points and have them become grammatically correct sentences, it works really well for that. And that's a genuine concern a lot of people have that is going to be largely alleviated with this. And I think it's great. This obviously, I mean, I barely scratched the surface. I didn't even talk about the question of whether these programs should be free or paid or what it would look like in either case and what differences it would make. People are talking right now about the changes in Reddit API and, you know, how that's going to affect ChatGPT. It's just, it's so much stuff that there's talk about. It's so interesting. It's so compelling. I have barely said anything, but these are a lot of thoughts I was having. And they're especially thoughts that I wish were more welcomed, you know, for example, in like write blur, I think right now the writing community on Tumblr is very anti AI, anything about AI, anything to do with AI. Um, and there is just no space to consider what the arguments against AI are saying about our beliefs with regards to disabled writers, um, to fan fiction, to copyright, you know, it's one of those cases where again, I think everyone at heart is like, I want artists to get support. I want them to live in dignity and safety and comfort, to use Brendan Lee Mulligan's uh, coffee shop term. The question is, how are we going to do that? And are we making sure to think critically as we work towards that conclusion, right? So at bottom, I really agree with everyone who's saying, oh, we AI sucks, don't use it. We need to make sure that artists are paid. I, I just don't think that this is the way that we're going to get artists paid. And I don't think it's helpful. And I think Worse, it's harmful because we're resting on a lot of incorrect assumptions about copyright and disability and numerous, numerous other things that I haven't even touched upon here. These were just some, some major signs. Um, share the essay, especially if you are a writer on Tumblr and you're like, wow, this was so cool and I liked it, or even this was fine. Um, you should reblog it because then people may see it and go, oh, interesting. I didn't realize that copyright was bad, which was basically my reaction to when I read The Ecstasy of Influence for the first time. And I was like, yeah, this settles it. We need to get rid of all of this. Um, I think that's really the wrap up. It is one o'clock. I'm just not going to think about that fact. Any further anythings from anyone... <laughs> before we disperse. Thank you. Here's another thought is I, I was very nervous posting the AI written thing to Patreon. Oh no, why is she yelling? I would squeeze her so much. I would shut her up. Um, when I posted that thing to Patreon, I was very concerned that people would basically go, oh, this guy is quote unquote pro AI or whatever we're calling it and would just mass murder me. Um, and I will say, you know, every so often I reblog something about AI and I, you know, probably lose a follower or two and that's fine. But I think I was concerned that someone would raise a point of, you know, why should anyone pay money? And to be clear, that's not a paid post. The newsletters are free, which is part of the reason I felt more or less comfortable doing it. But someone's like, why should someone pay money if you don't put in the effort? And that would get right to the heart of everything about Patreon, right? Why should anyone pay me money? Period, right? What amount of effort is enough? What is worth paying money for? When I upload something to Patreon, and this month, I, I do want to say thank you so much to everyone who's bearing with me. I'm very late um, in part because one, the, the easy post, the quote unquote easy post was going to be a painting and it's been taking me a really long time 
And I would like to give you something that is good. So it's going to take a little longer. It will happen in June. Don't worry. We're not pushing this into July. Uh, but I do want to acknowledge that, you know, I'm, I'm very late on that. And someone could reasonably say, well, why do we pay you money if you don't have the effort to just do that uh, without sleeping in all of the time between your shifts? That's a completely legitimate thing they could say. Well, not completely legitimate, but you see what I'm saying. And, and for the record, I mean, anyone, no one has to give you money for anything. I think that's clear, but a lot of people seem to think that people are required to give them money. So I just am going to go ahead and say that no one is required to stay on the Patreon for any reason ever or to be on it in the first place. But I think the concern I had is that is this idea that I could be manipulating people into giving me money that I don't deserve because I don't put in enough effort. And I've definitely thought that with my writing. I think it almost all the time, you know, when I, I don't put out K. Rainier because it's something that I really want to spend a lot of time on. And I miss, if we can really be honest, NaNoWriMo in high school. Oh, man. When I was just like blazing through my classes and it was, everything was, there was so much more time. And I was like, wow, this is great. I love now. I get to really focus on my craft. Um, and now I just, well, you know, I exist in the real world and there's no summer vacation. We're not getting into that. My point is clearly that, you know, you could always take issue with how much effort an artist does or does not put into their work. And I think that for a lot of people, it's not silly. Every time I say this, people go, you put out a short story every other month. Like, what are you talking about? And that's fair. That's 100% fair. Um, and I forget that I do that, by the way, because time feels like it's moving so quickly because I'm so busy that I, it, it is not apparent to me how much writing I do or do not put out. However, um, I still feel guilty that I don't put out more or that it's not better, or that I didn't spend more time on it. And that guilt underpins a lot of feelings around asking for money, naturally. And so I think there's a lot of questions to be asked around whether we are paying for a nebulous standard of effort, which I think is going to be inherently at some level ableist, right? How do we know how much effort something is for someone? Is it ever fair to, to make someone put in effort? Um, when we decide what amount of effort is correct. And, you know, specifically, I think that on Patreon, the majority of people who are there, and this is just because I, I do know a lot of people who are there more personally, are there not because, oh, I want to pay for specifically this painting that's going to come out this June on, you know, whatever date. They're paying because they want to help support Eves.Right. And that's the case regardless of what's going on. So I do owe it to my Patreon supporters to, to write, which of course I do. But, you know, this this is another question that came up for me when I was writing the newsletter with ChatGPT of what does this mean for the concerns that I already have? And who knows? Uh, I, I just want to say again, Max's comment in college nano is so much harder because everything is so hard. All the time, so hard. Just wait till you get a job. <laughs> I hope you never have to get a job. I hope that, like a suitcase full of money. You're like, what about it? I just hope a suitcase full of money. One of the things that astounds me where I live, and now we're just kind of having a, a, a chill stream, is I live in California, and so my rent is over $1,000 a month. And the fact that I have a, a great savings, I frankly am very, very lucky to have fantastic savings. I'm very comfortable in that regard. Um, I, I think often about how someone could drop a, a suitcase of $10,000, fill a suitcase of $10,000, and it wouldn't pay only my rent for a year. It's a, a huge amount of money, an astronomical amount of money. But even that would not be enough for me to survive for, I, I mean, ugh, anyway. And to be clear, this is slightly offset by the minimum wage here being obviously much higher. So I do earn, let me think about this. Um, I'm just going to tell you my paycheck. I don't, I don't care. I'm an artist. I don't make money. I work retail. I work at a bookstore. So I make, um, I do make a little over 2000 a month. I would say like something 2200 
I would say is like a comfortable number that it's usually roughly around. And it's like, whoa, so much money, you know? I I I worked for just two weeks and I made it a thousand dollars. Whoa. And it's like cool, you know. What about the rent now? <laughs> Uh, half my income goes to rent. So it's it's very strange to think about how much money is actually required because of the the cost because of the the cost of the goods and services. Anyway, for the record, yes, Theo, I also hope a suitcase full of money. I even Venmo you a suitcase full of money. It wasn't ten thousand dollars. I Venmo you one one pocket of money. <laughs> You know those like zip pockets on the front of suitcases? Like just that that part of the ten thousand dollar suitcase that we're all talking about. Um so really it all comes down to capitalism, of course. Oh, I can imagine. Absolutely, winning the lottery. And again, like can you imagine winning ten thousand dollars and then not even being able to like take a year off? Like, that's a fun vacation. It's a very luxurious fun vacation. It's not a time off. Oh, my God. I was actually thinking about this because I was thinking about how nice it would be to take a month off to write. And it's something that, in theory, I believe could be done at my place of work. But where is the where are the dollars? I've considered starting to put some money aside in like a little savings jar um, and try to see, is there an amount of money I could save yearly such that I could take a month off and just work on my writing once a year? It would not be nano because um, <laughs> we, um, being a retail establishment, We can't really lose people around Thanksgiving and then the the demon holiday that starts to see. So in effect, you just can't really take the time off. I honestly, like, I would not be, a, if it might be possible to take off most or maybe even all of November, just be so much more complicated. But if I thought about which month, it would probably be easier to do one where, um, the store is slower. So like a springtime, like April, March situation. May is a strong argument because uh, the my birthday is in it. But I feel like if I did May, the problem is if I took May off, it would become like, oh, it's my birthday month. And then I just don't know that I would do anything. In fairness, though, it would be kind of cute to work very hard that as a reward have a birthday bash. But this is just an idea. I mean, the problem is, like I said, like I, I would have to save like two thousand dollars. So where does that come from? <laughs> um, and obviously, it's the question between saving that money for that idea versus spending it on whatever else. You know what I mean? I mean, food and rent and, and utilities and whatever else. But also, like, if I want to buy a book. Right. If I want to go on vacation somewhere, if I want to bring someone here, if I want to take a day off for any other reason, it's just very difficult. And the idea that, you know, if we just didn't have AI, I would be paid, you know, fairly for my writing. It's like <laughs> we don't we barely have it. And it, it, I was never being paid fairly for anything. And I, you know, I don't want to say fairly, but you know, I, I wasn't being paid for my writing to begin with. I'm very grateful to have the patrons. I will say that right now. And I think it's also a good example the fact that I make, you know, I, I've been fluctuating up and down around hundred dollars on Patreon is amazing. And I'm so grateful. And it's just absolutely incredible. Um, and has actually been a life changing amount of money numerous times. There was a point when hormones were just financially not accessible to me without Patreon. Um, I had to use all the Patreon money for that. It, and more, it, they were very expensive. It was a whole insurance thing. Um, so in a way, you could say Patreon made me who I am. But 
like I just said, when your rent is, you know, over a thousand dollars, you also end up in a position where no amount of money is ever enough, no matter how incredibly gracious people are. It's not, it's the system. It's the problem. Clearly you need to come here to California and work in my bookshop. B, B, and B. I don't know why that's so funny to me. Um, <laughs> so in short, I think we just have to give everyone money, I guess. Not that. In short, we have to, you know, destroy capital and so on. But I, I do think it is very difficult to solve this problem because it is such a systemic one, such a complex one. And here we are talking about AI. And, you know, classic missing the forest for the trees, you know, focusing on something that's a lot easier to talk about on a smaller scale because it, we just don't know how to talk about the larger thing. There. We just don't know what to do. I know there's going to be someone who watches and goes, we already know what to do. Read my anarchist Tumblr. And that's very kind, but I think it is a little more complicated than that. But I, I do think things are getting better. And I, for the record, I think that in terms of an art form, as a tool, as a medium, this is so exciting. And I'm so incredibly excited to see where it goes. And I just... Oh, I'm so excited. Oh, God. Isn't there a chameleon in there? Well, sorry, I'm starting to chat again. Um, because apparently Delilah's in the room with the chameleon where she shouldn't be because there's a chameleon in there. No wonder she was meowing. Someone closed the door, probably thinking, let's make sure Delilah doesn't go there. <laughs> and one of the way Theo's asking, is the chameleon still in there? All right. Okay. Thank you, everyone, so much for coming. I'm going to funnel us into something, perhaps. Nope, everyone's offline. More than fair. All right, thank you, Max. Thank, all right, well, it's going to be 3.30 by the time I'm done thanking everyone. Thank you, everybody, for coming, whether you spoke or not. Thank you for reading the piece if you did, for listening to the piece if you did, for listening to my thoughts on the piece. This was so much fun. Um, I'm hopefully going to do this for other blog posts. I think I'll have to split it into chunks. This was really just a, a test of the situation. Thank you for helping me test that. Um, peace and love, peace and love. I'll see you on my Tumblr, eves.tumblr.com. You can follow me here and then whatever I do next, which is going to be just as weird and nonsensical as this, will be sent to your email inbox. And there's the Eves cord, bit.ly slash Eves cord. where you can join the Eavesdot Literary Universe Discord and talk about this and everything else. Have a good one, everybody. Thanks for coming.